like to hear the puppeteers as they play the characters that you cheer. So join us as we go, 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 below the frame. On this episode of Below the Frame, I'm talking to my friend John Tartaglia. We'll talk about how he got to Sesame Street, his many different projects, and of course, the brand new Fraggle Rock Back to the Rock series. We'll also be getting another Jerry story and song, so join us. It's time to go below the frame. Come on, follow me this way. Go, go, go below the frame. Welcome to Below the Frame with me, Matt Vogel. You know, including today's guest, there are only three more for this second season of Below the Frame. I know, it's gone by so quickly, hasn't it? I can't believe it. But uh, anyway, if you have enjoyed the podcast to this point, or at any point, please take a minute to rate and review it, and I uh, will say a little advance thank you right now for doing so. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so today on Below the Frame, I am talking to John Tartaglia. And, you know, John and I, we sort of started on Sesame Street more or less at the same time, although uh, he had been there well before me, as you're going to hear today. And, and, and anyway, I just love John. He, he, I always have. He's so, he's so full of positivity and, and light, and he's just a joy to be around. And we haven't really seen each other in person in several years, but it, it didn't feel like that when, you, when we sat down for this interview. Um, I think you'll see what I mean when we get to it. So let's do it. Let's go Below the Frame with John Tartaglia. Below the Frame. John Tartaglia, welcome to Below the Frame. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good. I love it down here. Below the Frame is a joyous place to be. <laughs> you comfy. actually, it is comfy, but you actually uh, do quite a bit above the frame. If yeah, we're we are, yes, and behind. And behind the frame, and under and around the frame as well. <laughs> yes. All the frames, all sides. If I'm familiar with all angles of the frame, shall good. we say. Fair. Very good, very good. There's my there's uh, my autobiography title. <laughs> All angles of the awful. That's pretty horrible. good. That's no, it's great. Uh, <laughs> hey, we're gonna we're gonna. I haven't seen you in so long. I don't know when the I last know. time we were face to face in real in the real it's world. It's been probably years. Yeah, I mean, probably pandemic aside, but yes, we also yes. haven't been in the same room for quite a while. I don't think. But yeah. I'm so glad to see you and talk to you virtually. Virtually, it feels like I'm there with you. Yeah, it really does. It does. It feels like I'm right there with you as well. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're going to we're going to go. We're going to talk about everything, but I'm going to leave a lot of stuff out. I'm sure because there's so much to talk about with you, John. We have many years. Well, I mean, you know, the fact that we've known each other literally since what 1995, yeah, four in there somewhere, and in there, started six, seven, the same something. season. Yeah. And yeah, I, know, I mean, insane. we we have a lot of shared history. It's crazy. That's right. That's right. Now you have so, now you have kids and a wife, uh, and like you have a whole life. I know. I, I'm well, out you here, too. like, yeah, I know we're crazy. What we're like grownups now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't. What happened? I don't know. It's going too fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. We're going to talk though. We're going to talk about. We'll go way back now. We're going to go way back to before I knew you. Where yes. did you grow up, John? I grew up. Uh, so for the first about ten years of my life, I lived in a place called Maple Shade, New Jersey. Um, which is South New Jersey. It's about 20 something minutes from Philadelphia. Um, and I grew, lived there until uh, I was about 10 years old. My parents got divorced when I was around, I think six. And so my mom and I lived by ourselves for about four years. And then she met my stepfather. And then we moved to a city called Upper Dublin, Pennsylvania, uh, which is uh, not too far from Philadelphia. It's actually uh, very near Bucks County, uh, which mm -hmm. led to me working at Sesame Place. Um, and I lived there until I was 18. And then I moved to New York City. So I was yeah. kind of like the tri-state boy. I was like New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, tell me about uh, a little bit about growing up in Pennsylvania, in Bucks, near Bucks County, and uh, what was that like growing up? Well, it was it was so different from you know New Jersey, where I was born. Is a very uh, Maple Shade is a very blue collar, wonderful city. You know, li literally railroad tracks down the middle of it, um, and you know that was my where I found all of my inspiration as a kid. That's where I first discovered the Muppets and Fraggle Rock and everything like that. But when I moved to Pennsylvania, um, that town was was very arts based. They had an amazing high school arts program, 
Um, and that's part of the reason my family moved us there, because um, they saw that I loved to perform and they saw that that was a big part of me. And, and my stepfather, being a very loving, considerate person, was like, he needs to have a, a school that's going to foster that. And so um, so that's that's living in that city was so, I think, really defined a lot of my life. And I did all my big theater shows there. That's where I really got into musical theater. And then when I was like, you know, 14 or 15, I was like, wait, there's a place called Sesame Place? What? <laughs> um, which I don't think I went to as a kid. I don't remember. I don't have a memory of being there really as a kid. I, maybe when I was, maybe once or twice, but it was definitely not like a, like a yearly thing for me if I did go. And I remember going for the first time and it was like, I'd never seen Sesame Street live before. And it was the first time I saw the walk around Sesame Street characters. And it felt like the the closest step to where I wanted to be, which is obviously working with quote unquote, the real Muppets. Mm. And uh, so, and that year that I happened to discover it, they were starting for the first time to have puppets. They were having Oscar the Grouch as a puppet for the first time. And so they were looking for puppeteers and it was just like this magical, mystical, you know, meant to be kind of moment. And so that's, so I, I'm really thankful I grew up in that town because it kind of, I was close enough to New York that I could go to New York City, which obviously happened eventually. And then it was also just right there next to Sesame Place. And I had this great theater arts program. So I felt, I just, I felt so lucky, you know, live, growing, uh, living there. So I'm guessing you got the job as Oscar the Grouch. I did. Well, I kind of, so, so they, at the time, I don't remember exactly how it works, but I think that they were like, they had cast the Oscars by mm-hmm. the time I actually applied, but they're like, but you could be a theater host which is basically where like you, you are, you like man the stage. So like, if like, you know, some kid just like runs up on stage and like cookie monster won't like trample them. You like pull the kid off, you, kick him. you know, you kick the kid. Yeah. You just <laughs> flip them off now. Right. Um, and, and, and so like, and I was in charge of like cleaning up the theater. I was horrible at the theater host because <laughs> all I wanted to do <laughs> right. was do the show. Right. And so while I should have been like cleaning the theater or watching the audience or, <laughs> Whatever I was supposed to be doing, I was just like watching the show, staring and like, you know, lip syncing along with my hand. And I'm sure they were just like, just give him the job. So eventually (laughs) they were like, do you want to be Oscar? I was like, yes. Uh, uh, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I do. It's so funny that the things that we're meant to do or we're best at, we're, we're, we're really good at them. And the things that we're not meant to do (laughs) and the things that we really don't want to do, it kind of shows we're just, we're not good at them. (laughs) I, you know, I, I've always been the kind of person that I, I would have put myself a hundred percent in that job, but I think down deep inside, I knew that yeah. that's what I wanted to do. Like I could yeah, feel that that's what, I, and I kind of knew I was going to somehow. So I yeah. think I'm either that or they were just like, he's annoying. Please give him the job. <laughs> that's probably what came down to. <laughs> How long did you do that job at Sesame Place? Uh, for four years. And, and it was really, you know, again, it taught me a lot because first of all, that, that Oscar puppet, you know, for them to last Right. Because they have to there. It was really the Sesame Street Live version of the character that I was using. And, you know, Sesame Street Live goes on tour for, you know, a year at a time, if not more. And so they built them, you know, most most hand puppets are built out of lovely light materials like foam (laughs) and and light rubber and things like that. And, and, And this Oscar literally was made out of fiberglass. Oh. Like a light fiberglass, but a fiberglass. Uh, I light fiber. Um, and so it was. It was really hard. And you, the you know, if, from like the the TV show, they kind of combined the puppet and like the walk around Oscar. You know, with like the can that you wear with like the legs. So, oh, yeah. So it was like half costume, half puppet. So you would you would walk out in the can with the legs on and you'd sit down and then you'd have to hit this lever with your shoulder and come up as Oscar with this giant oh fiberglass gosh. head that I'm sure uh, gave me permanent damage. And it's amazing. It was amazing. But I will say it was such a good lesson in like endurance and in just like, and I, I didn't care because I loved it so much. I was so happy to do it. And then they saw how possibly insanely passionate I was <laughs> and, and that I had, I could dance. I had movement skills. So they actually, um, let me also do Cookie Monster and do Bert as well. So mm-hmm. I really got to foster my dance skills there. I did this, and that, you know, dancing in a costume character like that is just talk about like learning patience and endurance and, <laughs> and respect. Yeah. And, you know, so I really, it was really a formative part of my life. And I, and I made really great friends and, and, you know, it's just, it was a wonderful place to work. I learned a lot. I, I feel like we've missed just a little bit. Here. <laughs> I feel like we've missed the part about where, I mean, you mentioned it a little bit, but, the part where you fell in love with Muppets, the part where you fell mm-hmm. in love with puppetry, 
How, when did that happen? I mean, it must have been, it, you must have been very young. I was. It was a, it was a very distinct moment. So I, I, you know, I remember watching Sesame Street growing up. Um, you know, in my toddler years, and, and I, I have, you know, visceral memories of, of Big Bird and, and things like that. Um, but at that point, I wasn't into puppetry. I was just into the characters, you know, and I also loved Mr. Rogers. I loved Captain Kangaroo and Carol and Paul in the Magic Garden. Like, I loved all these very important shows to me as a kid. Uh, discovering puppetry came from Fraggle Rock. When my, when, after my parents got divorced, my mom and I had to take a trip down to see my grandmother in Tennessee. And we didn't have a lot of money. And so I think we took the bus, if I remember correctly, and we would stay, like we would break up the trip and we stayed in a motel. And if you remember the eighties, right. Mm -hmm. One of the big selling points at these <laughs> motels was like free HBO, right? Because yes. No oh, yeah. HBO, right. We couldn't afford That's right. HBO. And, uh, so I remember we stayed at a, at a motel and I will, I, I can see it. Like I remember my mom turning on the TV and boom, there was Fraggle Rock. And it was Gobo Fraggle, and he was right there with Moki, and I can I could see the scene in my head, and I just remember this like instant. My mom describes it as like this instant wonder. Like I just had to watch this show, and I had to know how it was made, and I had to everything about it. My mom got me the the you know the album, the old LP album, and I remember the day when I was sitting up in my room because I would just listen to it over and over again, and I would I would. We had a we had a VCR that we did have, and so I like went to like the local video store and just like hoarded like every Fraggle Rock, you know, <laughs> tape. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I remember the day I was looking at the cast recording, and I saw on the back, you know, uh, you know Jerry Nelson as Gobo Fraggle Pogor. I was like, wait, there's people that do like it. Just started to click that this yeah. fantasy world I loved was brought to life by people, and that like they do this. And wait a minute. And that's what really started my love for the art of puppetry and the art of television. And, and I just did from then on, I just became completely obsessed and like, you know, just, and, and you, you know, you grew up at the same time. Like, you know, if you didn't see something on TV, you had to pray that they released it on home video. <laughs> yeah, that's you right. know? yeah. You couldn't go was, to YouTube. There was no Google. You couldn't no, just look it up. No, no, it's, there was no bootlegs. There was nothing. It was just like, it was like, you know, and so, there was a lot of like happy coincidences where like, you know, we happened to catch the Jim Henson hour or we happened to watch, you know, when they re-aired, you know, Fraggle Rock, uh, down right. Fraggle Rock behind the scenes. So those things I, I remember just seeing and just, they just, it was like downloading information as quickly as possible. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, that's really, that was really the show and the moment that just, I said, boom, that's what I want to do. But it makes sense that there's that moment of, of you, you believe the magic of what it is you're watching. Yeah. And then, and you're so invested in it and you're so interested in it that there must be part of us that goes like, well, what is, what, what's, how is this even coming about? Maybe you weren't even aware yeah. of it until you looked, like you said, at the back of that record and you saw Jerry's yeah. name there. And then there was this, up, like a second bit of magic that like explodes yeah. in your brain of how... What these are Someone's people doing this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, I, no, it's you're amazing. Right. I remember. I think. I think you're right. I think it was the feeling. I remember, especially that show because it's you know the, the the stories were so soulful and it was you know I mean and you know and I don't have to tell you like the the topics that were dealt with and you know I remember feeling so many things as a kid mm. from it watching it you know and really yeah. caring about the characters and wanting to cry at sad moments and and I thought I think that was the first time I remember something art based affecting me like that, you know, and, and making me invest where I really cared about these characters' lives. And I really cared about this world, you know, like the episodes where all of a sudden, like the, the water for the pond is in peril. I was like, <gasps> like, it just, it, it, I don't know why it was such a, such a distinct thing. And so, yeah, you're right. I think that made it more human and that made me go, Oh, like, I want to do that. I want to like use yeah. what I love to do. Cause I was always doing voices and I was always, mm -hmm putting on shows for my parents in my right. my bedroom and, and did, my Did you have puppet toys? Did you have like toy puppets or did you make your own puppets? I made my own for the most part. I made my own. My grandmother uh I she did give me when she found out I loved uh puppets, she gave me like a like a like a like a ventriloquist dummy, like a almost like a howdy duty, but not a howdy duty. He looked like howdy duty, yeah. but not really and I, I, I didn't love that. I, I wanted to appreciate it. Like I was like, right. thanks so much. But this I just, I just like that. Just you know how it is. It's like once you discover yeah. the kind of puppetry you love, it sometimes you just get so stuck on that. So yeah, I would make 
Um, like I, I learned that, you know, puppets were carved out of foam or were made with foam. And so my, my stepfather would, you know, other kids were being driven to like baseball practice and mm. soccer camp. And I was like, let's go to Joanne fabrics, you know, like, <laughs> right. right. I need to get some, summer. I don't know, a half inch foam quarter inch. Foam. I need some foam. And how did you put it together? Did you hot glue it together? I hot glued it. That's and, what I did too. Uh. Yeah. And it's like, so I mean, painful. I still have burns. I have like burn marks on my hands from hot glue guns because, you know, I, uh, I was not meant to be a builder for sure. I, I love either. building. Like when I do, I build sometimes for fun because I do mm. love the, uh, there's something cool about creating something out of nothing. But I look at, you know, the amazing builders that do what they do <laughs> I who know. are such artists. And I'm like, I, like, I, I was that, that kid who was like, I'd get like halfway through the head and I'd be like, all right. And like slap it together. Like, <laughs> yeah, this one me you too. Build. I, yeah, I just no want it to desire. be, I want it to be done. I want it to be yeah. at the finished point. Yes. I can't skip, I, you know. Yeah, I, no, was, I, was, I, was, I was the same horrible. way. So and I respect once, that so much because of that. Because I was like, that is not me. Yeah, you're right. Once you see an artist's <laughs> rendition of like a, a puppet that's a beautiful puppet, you, it's just, yeah. You, I always you had like, se- like seams were crooked and like you'd see like <laughs> yeah. a giant glob of hot <sighs> glue sticking out of the set. Like that's all right. those, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, just, uh, nobody will notice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's know. so funny. And so you had this obsession as a child. You yeah. also were very in, involved and, and active in, in theater, musical theater. Yes. Uh, you got a job at Sesame Place. So you're kind of like heading in a very specific direction. It yes. sounds like you're heading toward Sesame Street. Uh, yes. Now, how did that kind of thing happen? Well... It's a really, I mean, you know, I really believe in magic and I believe that everything happens for a reason the way it's supposed to. And I, and I also really believe in, um, before it was, before I knew what the word was and before I, it was like, you know, the secret or the Oprah love of the secret, (laughs) you know, I really believe, I guess, in manifestation and that Mm -hmm. if you really want something bad enough and you really tell the universe that you want it that badly and you really put every effort into it. Not always, but a lot of times it it will happen. And I think that you you can bring those good things to your life. And so, I don't think I was consciously doing that as a kid. I don't think I understood that concept. Right. But when I was, it started when I was about uh, seven or eight, and I wrote. Uh, well, first of all, I, my mom tells a story of I walked into the, the kitchen. <laughs> she was like making dinner, and I and I was a very, as you can imagine, Matt, because you know me, this is going to be shocking mm-hmm. to you. I was a very. Uh, um, loud and uh, a, a big personality child. What? Crazy. Nah, I, don't I know. Believe it. <laughs> Shocking. Um, but apparently I walked in while she was making dinner and I'd been, you know, into puppets at this point and really gotten into my Fraggle Rock face. And I apparently walked in and said, hi mom, just so you know, um, when I'm 18, I'm going to graduate high school and I'm going to move to New York City. I'm going to work for the Muppets. Bye-bye. And I just kind of like, and she was like, okay, like she, you know, cause she's an actress and a singer. So she, she, thank God my family, all, all four of my parents supported my, my art, my love. Um, and she, she just like loves that story. She's like, okay, sure. Yeah, fine. And so that was the mentality, right? It was just kind of yeah. like, I was like, oh, that's just what you do. Like, I wasn't thinking about what if I don't get asked to, or <laughs> what, yeah, if, how do I even get in? What how do I, I get there? It was like, yeah. no, this is, this is going to happen. Um, so I wrote to Jim Henson a letter, uh, mm-hmm. probably when I was about seven or eight, that was very much, you know, a, a fan letter. And, and it said something akin to that in the letter that was basically like, I, you know, I want to work with you when I'm, when I graduate high school, this is my dream, this is my job, my, my dream, my dream job. And I sent it off and I didn't hear anything for about a year. And this is the truth. It sounds very like, you know, I don't know, Aaron Sorkin movie, but this is very true. <laughs> that the day that I sat down, you know, I was, when you're a kid, you don't think like, oh, that person didn't read my letter. They don't, they don't, they're not going to write back to me. You think, oh, they didn't get my letter. Like you, you put the right. innocent spin on it, right? Yeah. So I remember after school that this particular day, I sat down to write another letter to Jim and I started writing it and there was a knock at the door and it was the postman. And he had a, a package that didn't fit in our, our mailbox, and it was from the Jim Henson Company. So I what? opened it up. I swear to God, open it up. And of course, I was just like freaking out. I open it up, and it's a beautiful 8x10 photo signed by Jim. And a ni- really nice letter from his secretary, I'm assuming, saying something to the, to the effect of like, you know, Jim is overseas right now, and he's filming a movie. So he wasn't able to write back personally, but we made sure that he saw your letter, and he wanted to make sure you had – I mean – 
it was it was everything I wanted to hear, right? But like, wow. but this person, this 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 man that was like everything to me, um, knew even in a very small way who I was, right? Yeah. And yeah. so I totally loved it and freaked out. So fast forward to I guess a year later, maybe. I mean, I'm. It's always hard to keep track of exactly when things happen, but because you know, as a kid, everything happens in like a week, right? right. Yeah. But it's um, all happening. It's all happening. But I guess probably about a year later, I was at school. And I get called to the principal's office because there's a phone call. And my mom, you know, and I lived alone. And, you know, the, you, as a kid, you're, when you're a kid, a latchkey kid, where you, like, let yourself in the door by yourself. Like, I would go home by myself after school. I was just always ready for, like, things to change. You know, it, just, it was just part of life, right? Like, you're going to go to your aunt's tonight. You're going to, you know. So I thought, uh-oh, what's wrong? Pick up the phone. And she's like, hi, this is, I think her name was Kate, from the new Mickey Mouse Club in Florida. She's like, um, do you watch the show? And I was a huge, you can imagine, a huge yeah. fan of that. I was like, do I watch yeah. it? I want to be on it, lady. Um, <laughs> so I was like, oh, yeah. And she's like, uh, well, you know, we have something called Guest Day where we have celebrities on and they interview real kids like you. And Jim Henson's going to be on. And he recommended your name as one of the kids that might want to interview him. Swear to God. So. What? Yeah, as I always tell the story, I pretty much just like pooped myself right there in the, in the, in the, in the principal's <laughs> office. I didn't, but it felt like I did. Right. And I remember being like, oh, okay. And basically, over the process of like three weeks, we would write, we'd like write 20 questions I would ask Jim, a biography of myself, which I'm sure was hilarious at like, you know, however old I was, like, John loves toys. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> and, uh, and I, said, I think I had to send a picture. We sent it off. And it got narrowed down. It was like started with like 30 something kids. And I got narrowed down and narrowed down and narrowed down. And finally it was between me and this other kid who I've met, who's awesome. His name, his name is Joe, and he is an animator and so talented, the loveliest guy in the world. And uh, it got it got down to the two of us, and they picked him. And I remember just being like, oh, that was the first time I'd ever experienced like as a kid getting so close to something so amazing and then not getting it, you know, and yeah. lose it. like, you know, like, like those, that kind of high stakes level. That you, oh, that, right. I mean, this was everything adult. you had dreamed of like that. Yeah. I can only imagine as a child who had never really, you know, we don't, we ex- experience as kids kind of small disappointments really, but this seems like this would have crushed you. Oh yeah. And it was like, it was like, if I'd won, I would have spent the day with him on the set of Muppet Vision 3D and all these amazing things that like looking oh back, you know, gosh. met all my heroes. And that so, Joe got to do. That Joe got to do. But he's, <laughs> he's I, I'm telling you, when we met, it's like, I think he was almost scared to tell me. And I was like, I love you. I'm so glad. I was like, tell me everything. Um, oh, wow. so, so yeah, so, so I didn't win and I was devastated. And then I think it was probably a few months later, you know, Jim passed away. And I remember just that, just my mom always says, I just went crazy. Like I was just like, cause that was really, I, my grandmother, had, my father's mother had passed away when I was about seven, but I wasn't super close to her. So, so I hadn't had that kind of loss in my life yet where you just, yeah. you lose someone that you feel so that, that even though I never met Jim, I felt so close to him. Yeah. Do you remember where so, you were when you heard? Yes. I remember coming home from school and I remember my mom uh, she was crying. She was really upset. Oh. And uh, it's funny. I, I think what I remember is that she handed the phone to me. It was my dad. I'm sure, I, I guess mm. she had said, like, you have to tell him or something. And my dad told me. And I just, I, I think I cried for like three days straight. And I think, and actually the yeah. story my mom loves to tell is that I was so devastated that I, I wanted to, like, I wanted the rest of the world to feel what I was feeling. So I put, I made a sign. <laughs> I drew a picture of Kermit and I made a sign that said honk if you love Jim Henson. And I would put, I put it in the back seat of our car. This is so true. And I would lay on the back seat of, of the car with my Kermit puppet and I would puppeteer it in the back and we'd be like driving down the street. And of course, of course people weren't honking. And my mom was, I was like, mom, like crying. I'd be like, why aren't they honking? And my mom, brilliant actress, she goes, Oh, honey, they're they're just too devastated. They can't honk either. Like she was like so. But she's I like, they're, love they're too... that story. That is so <laughs> sweet. That is just so heart. It's just it touches my heart. It's and it, it makes me want to cry, John. That's just so, so beautiful. <laughs> oh my gosh! I mean, that's, I was yeah. You I was were, a wreck. You were devastated. Yeah, I was yeah. devastated, and I love my mom for that. That she didn't just you know take it down. Like she didn't like you know make me feel silly. She was like she like kept it going. Right. But like, no, they're yeah. devastated. Like, like, like we all are, honey. Um, so oh. yeah, so that, that was really, you know, upsetting. And then 
gosh, it's, it's such a long story. I'm sorry. No, um, it's fine. Then uh, a couple years later, probably, um, we would moved to Pennsylvania at this point, and dinosaurs was on the air. And I love dinosaurs, right? Oh, yeah. Another yeah. another big like, wow! I want to do that. Like you know, a whole other level of puppetry, yeah. yeah, animatronics and and the humor. It was so adult, and I loved the fact that it was on prime time, so so many of my friends knew what it was, and you know, it was a thing, right? Mm-hmm. And I loved Baby Dinosaur, loved Baby Dinosaur. So I wrote a fan letter to Kevin, and uh, I remember like. A year later, maybe, I guess, again, time, it gets weird, but I get a phone call and, and my stepfather, I'll never forget this. He's like, he's like, you have a call. And it was like, you know, six o'clock at night. I was like, okay, who, who is it? He's like, someone named Kevin Cash. And I was like, huh. And I just didn't click, you know, and yeah. I picked it up and, oh, this is Kevin Clash. And I was like, what? And <laughs> He was amazing and basically invited my me and my mom to go to the set. He's like, you know, he's like, I got your letter and, you know, we're always looking for new up and coming puppeteers and come visit Sesame Street. So we actually, the first time we went, we went to go visit Dog City. They were filming Dog City at the time. And it was, I just remember, I can see, I like, I remember, I'm sure, I, I, I bet for you, like with walking on the set of Sesame Street, right? I can yeah. still sense everything. I can remember the smell of the studio. I can remember the, how everyone looked, I can remember everything about mm-hmm. that moment because it was such a big deal. And um, it was at 2, uh, 225, right? The old carriage house studio. Yeah. So it was the little yeah. studio. And I remember walking in and just being like, oh my God. And that's where I first saw and met Fran Brill and David Rudman and Joey Mazzarino and Kevin. And I think Lisa Buckley was working then. And all these wonderful puppeteers that ended up you know, being such a huge part of our lives. And on a, on lunch break, uh, Kevin took us around the workshop, and I got to try on all the you know I got to try on Bird and Cookie Monster, all the all the puppets I loved. And then I remember I was a very kind of, <clears throat> for lack of a better word, I hope this isn't inappropriate, ballsy kid. Like I wasn't afraid to like you know ask questions and speak yeah. my mind. And I remember I said I was like, "What made you call me?" You know, because at the time this was like right when Elmo was becoming a thing. Right, he was mm-hmm. incredibly huge, and you know, out of the thousands of letters. And I'll never forget, Kevin said, well, Jim used to talk about you. And I remember the floor dropped out at that moment. <laughs> yeah. Just dropped. I mean, like, I, I can still feel that feeling. It was like ice water just went, <sighs> like, I couldn't speak for a minute. Jeez. And my mom said, what? Like, she was, you know, and he's like, yeah. He's like, well, Jim would always talk about up and coming puppeteers and to keep an eye out for them. And, you know, your letters made an impression. And I just was like, so I always tell people, and this is the God's honest truth, that I, I, I always say, even though I never met him, that I am convinced that the only reason I have my career is because of Jim. Mm-hmm. And, and late, years later, I talked to Alex Rockwell, who was Jim's creative assistant for years and created a bunch of shows I've gotten to work on right here. And I told her that story, and I almost felt embarrassed telling her because I was like, is this like my, my, my childhood warped, <laughs> like, like right. everything will yeah. be perfect when I'm older? You know, like, like was I just right. making up this... And I told her, she said, and she, without a beat, she was like, oh, no, that totally sounds like Jim. She's like, he would always, always keep an eye out on the next generation of puppeteers. He thought it was so important, especially towards the end of his life. And so that just kind of reconfirmed for me. But, but wow. yeah, so, so that's literally how my association started. And then from there, I got invited to the workshops, those, mm-hmm. those you know, quote unquote workshop auditions. And, <laughs> yep. you know, and just started, started going in for that. And I worked my first day professionally when I was 16. So it was just like, I really do believe like it was my, my, <laughs> my insane positivity and belief in the possible that made that happen. I had a lot of really huge luck. <laughs> Let's be honest. Yeah. Well, you know, luck is always a part of it <laughs> in some way. It just is. Somehow, it just yeah. is a part. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think you're right, John. I think your, your positivity also, you know, I think one of the important parts when you're when somebody who's looking for new puppeteers, you want to have somebody around that is positive, that is a, a yeah. nice person, a good person. That's important. Yeah. So, so let me ask you this: Yeah, what do you remember? What your first day on Sesame was like? Maybe when you were 16, that first day. What did you do? Do you remember? Well, kind of. So, here's the the God's honest truth, and I could say it now: is that the first time I visited the set of Sesame Street was the first time I worked 
<laughs> but it oh, that wasn't was back in the days. To... Right. <laughs> you, yes. Right? Yeah, you I got pulled four, in. I was 14, and I remember I was there with my mom, and they were shooting the 25th anniversary special, Stars and Stripes uh-huh. Forever, or something, or Stars and Street Forever. Uh-huh. And uh, which I remember because the guest star was Rosie O'Donnell, and I loved Rosie O'Donnell. So I was just like, <laughs> bling, like watching the whole time. <laughs> That's right. But, at, you know, and there was a big group scene. It was the finale song. And I remember I was just there to watch. I was just a guest. And Kevin grabbed me and threw me back with John Kennedy. And John Kennedy was performing The Count uh, behind Oscar's area, his old area. And he was like, you're going to do you're going to do his right hand. And he just like threw me into his right hand. And, you know, I, I mean, I'd never puppeteered with anybody before. It was such a new, exciting, oh, my God, experience. And John Kennedy, I was like, oh, this is a real puppeteer. And I'm working with him. And John was so sweet. You know, John, he's the sweetest man in the yeah. world. And he was so kind and so patient with him. Sure, and I, I just remember being really sweaty. That's all I remember. <laughs> because I was so scared and so nervous. nervous. Yeah. And my mom was like, I remember looking over at my mom. like, And she was just like, she kept doing this. She was so proud. And so that was actually the first thing I did. Um, that's pretty good though. Oh my God, it was huge. And it was, and it was just like, I would have been happy if that had been it. You know what I mean? I was like, I got to (laughs) hold a real puppet on Sesame Street and do this for, you know, 20 minutes. Um, and then the first like real, real job, I think it was Elmo saves Christmas. I feel like is the answer. Mm. I feel like that was the first big Sesame Street thing I did. I don't remember for sure, but I think that's what it was. Do you remember what you did in that? I did a lot of doubling, which I remember being really surprised about because, you know, I think what, what, what Kevin recognized was that I wasn't in any way, shape or form ready to do voices or characters yet. Right. But when I was younger, I always had a, I mean, I think it's probably my theater and my movement background, but I, I had a really good sense of musical manipulation and lip sync. So a lot of my first things I did were, were kind of like lip sync based or choreography based or movement based or standing in for another right. person. Um, and I, I, I was good at switching techniques and, and like I could imitate the way David mm-hmm. moved a puppet or the way that Kevin, you know, which are, which are also very different, right? We all have our yeah, own very little different. styles. Yeah. And so that's what I remember. I, I, the first time I ever spoke, I think was like, I really actually, it might've been I, was what it? you and I and Alice yeah. did that. Crew that four, the, the crew yes. four with the Kingston, uh, Livingston, the third Kingston's crew. Yeah. And I yeah. remember like, that was like horrifying. Oh my gosh. Cause that was yeah. the first time I'd ever spoken <laughs> and had was, a character that had yeah. a name. Yeah. Along with like Alice Deneen, who, oh, see, you know, was so wonderful. The and yes. then with Kevin, who was Kingston and just, if, and it was, yeah, it was just us. Oh my god! And gosh. it was all like, was that your first speaking role? Uh, I, there may have been one other, like one line somewhere, right, right, right. but, but this was like the biggest thing for sure Same. that I had done up to that point. And it was terrifying. And it was- we were <laughs> rapping. We were doing these those, <laughs> like raps. <laughs> yes. We were doing and, raps. We were singing. We yeah. were doing choreography. We were yeah. w- brand new characters <laughs> that had to like, like come in at a certain time. I remember you and uh. I both were just like. We just kept like uh, like like mentally checking in with each other. Other, uh-huh. I think it was kind of like looking at each other, being like, "You good? You good? Okay. Like, you good? <laughs> <laughs> you okay? You know, yeah. you right? Okay." But it was uh, horrifying. It was horrifying. Yeah, it was, and, but, I, but, and I watch that back, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, it sounds like me. Like, I, there's no character. <laughs> me too. Yeah, that's me. Uh, uh, that's that's my voice. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know. But oh, here's a question I wanted to ask, John. Yes. When did when did you learn monitor technique? Mm. So, I mean, this is where I really am so grateful to my family. Like, they supported me 100%. So, I think probably around, like, um, as soon as I figured it out that, like, that's what you had to do, um, my, I want to say my mom and my stepfather, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that they supported me in getting, like, one of those, you know, used giant camcorders. Remember the ones from the 80s where it was, like... Yeah. Like you'd like break your shoulder by holding it. It was like you had to what put is the happening? VHS tape in it. <laughs> yeah, like the big was, VHS tape inside. It was so big. Uh, it was so huge. But I got uh, one of those and I remember putting it on like a cabinet and they found an old TV. <laughs> we, we figured it out. I don't remember how. Um, so I, I kind of started doing that pretty young. And I think that's why I had a, a I was lucky. I think I had like a step ahead because of that. Because I yeah, had that you did, yeah. basic understanding of monitor. 
Um, so yeah, I think probably when I was like, I'm going to guess 12, maybe I probably started doing that. Um, wow. but you know, it's, and it's funny, there's so many really, really great puppeteers who can be so good with manipulation, but then you get on that monitor and you're just, you know, you're watching yourself for the first time and it's like, Oh my God, what is happening? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so it's, I feel lucky I had that, that, like I call it my, my, my I always say puppetry is like a, a basement art <laughs> meaning that like you can practice it in your basement, which is where I did all yeah. my practicing. Like I go down to our basement and put on my puppet and put on my mind and just spend hours down there just lip syncing them well, songs. And well, I remember, I remember thinking, you know, seeing you cause I was, I was pretty new at monitor technique and I was working on it in my apartment. I'd moved to New York and that's when I was starting to work on it. You know, when I moved wow. to New York yeah, and just seeing you and going, man, he's so good. Like it just is like, it's so smooth and everything. Oh my gosh. So really? Thank so you. Amazing. Yes, absolutely. And I just thinking like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta up my game. I gotta get, I gotta keep working. <laughs> Because it is like so, it's it takes a while. I mean, I think there are some people that can just like boom, they've got snap it. right in. Yeah, but it's a dance. It's it's kind it of is. It, it is. I I think puppetry is is like dance. I think everyone can do it. It's just how much comes naturally to you. Right. You I know, mean, you should see me do Swan Lake, John. <laughs> Hey, I have seen you dance, Matt Vogel, and you're a good dancer. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, you are. I won't let you, I won't let you take yourself down. Well, no, but I mean, I think also like you know, you you learn so much too by by being on set. I mean, I feel like you know, like you were saying earlier about being a positive person. You know, it's it's that's that's like I hate to say it. That's like forty percent of the job is like how you work on a set. You know, put mm -hmm. aside like your actual skills and your voices and your talent. Like it's, it's when you're with a group of people and you're learning how to collaborate with the director and the writer and the, your other performers. And like, you know, I'd only ever done it by myself, except for my, my girlfriend at the time, she and I, she luckily is a wonderful puppeteer. Her name is Jamie Donmeyer in Florida, very talented puppeteer. I'm sure you've met her before. Oh, yeah. You know, we both got into it. We both loved it. So I had a, a partner to, to practice off of, but, but at that point, Jamie had never had television experience. So we really, I really came in so raw to what it was like to really, you know, do three camera cuts, you know, when you're oh, yeah. shooting with camera. Oh, shooting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of that was just like, you know, I put on a good face, but deep down inside, I was just like always nervous and sweating, you yeah, know, cause it, I was it just never, it, it didn't, I didn't, I never noticed that. I never, never showed like you just always seemed kind of, to me, you always seem very unflappable. You always seem very confident and happy to be, I'm very excited. I mean, the thing that obviously everybody can say this about you, John, is that, you you came into the room. You were so young because you are younger than me by several years and uh, a I few years. Several. Okay, a few. all right, all right. <laughs> a, a few. Years. You're a few years younger than me, <laughs> and and just your your energy, your energy, your youthful energy, and you know, uh, thankfully you weren't eaten by the lions because that <laughs> that can happen. You know what I mean? Yeah, like that. Yeah. That people can people. It's easy for people to get jaded in a job, even a job as wonderful as uh, being on Sesame Street because, you know, it, it yeah. can be a grind, it's it's work, it's hard. Well, and, and you are stay... coming into, you're coming into an established family. And that's, yeah. that's what I had to learn was that, you know, you read the Muppet books and you read the making of and you, and you, and you read about, or you see, you know, the making of documentaries and it's like, you know, it is a family and it's a wonderful family, but like any family, you know, what does a family do when someone new comes in? Right. It's <laughs> oh, like, yeah. it's yeah. like, you know, when you're, when your brother <laughs> comes home with his new girlfriend, you're like, boom, like everyone yeah. like focuses <laughs> down and it's like, so how did you meet? Like there's, there's, there's that point where you're, you're not, it's not, it's not, it's not that you're not welcoming someone in, but you're, I think it's instinctual. Like you're, 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 you're protecting what's there already and see right. how that person fits in. Right. And I think, it's easy to forget that, that like, you know, we were, and we also came in at a time where there was a lot of change, yeah. right? The show had expanded. There was a yeah. brand new set that needed to be filled. There was, there was, I mean, there was like seven or eight of us that were coming in more regularly. And mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of a couple of people, like hadn't been there before. So it, it was, it was a combination of like standing out because you wanted to show that you could do it and you wanted to be picked to do certain things. 
which already allows itself for for competition. Yeah. But but then it's also new personalities where you're you're in the Muppet Room, which you know the old Muppet Room. I don't know what it's like mm-hmm. today, but the old Muppet Room was like the size of like a utility closet, <laughs> and so yeah. you're literally on so top small. of each other. I'll never forget that. It was like you just be like, can I just step over? I just want to grab like my sandwich. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, I did I elbow you, Jerry Nelson? I'm sorry. Like it was so <laughs> nuts. That. It was like what's happening? You know, and and so you're you're learning how you fit in, and I think the blessing in my life and the curse was that I was just so incredibly excited to be there that I think I drove a lot of people nuts because I was so excited, but I think you couldn't deny that it was honest, that it was like pure absolutely. excitement that was oh, absolutely. truthful. Um, and I think and, also it, it gets coupled with, you're like, oh damn, he's also really talented. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> then yeah. that that's, that's, you know, that can be uh, frustrating maybe, but, but oh. I, 100%. And now I understand it. I didn't understand it then. I would, I, you know, <clears throat> I go home and be like, why, why would they mean to be today? Like, you know, and like, and I definitely got hazed. And, and I honestly, right. to be honest, I'm thankful for it because it made me stronger and learn to find my yeah. footing a little bit. Yeah. But I mean, I didn't understand. Now I do. Now I get it. It's like there was, there was, you know, there's 20 jobs, let's say, and there's 50 people. So, yeah. I mean, I'm being very, you know, I'm using bad numbers here, but like, you get the right. idea. Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's, there's so, and it's such hard work and it's such important work and all of us care and all of us want to do it. And, you know, so I get it. I get now why there was hazing. Absolutely. But, but, and also it's like the little brother coming in. You're like, okay, there's the little brother. He's the Mark. Let's get him. You know, and 100%. I, we will be back with John Tartagli in a few minutes, but first it's time for a Jerry story. On today's Jerry story, John Kennedy returns to read another story written by the late great Muppet performer, Jerry Nelson. And just a warning. This Jerry story does talk about drug use. Here's John. You know, I worked so many years with Jerry Nelson, and he was so nice to me. Uh, One time, I remember I was writing my first puppet-making book, and I needed some quotes for the back of the book. So I asked some people if they would write some, and I asked Jerry, because I really respected Jerry. And uh, he said, of course he'd do that. So he wrote it. It was a super nice quote, and was I sent it off. My editor sent it off to China to get it printed, and the books came back, and Jerry's quote wasn't on it. And I felt terrible. I was like, what happened? And they said, it, uh, it just wasn't enough space. I guess they made them big enough for people to read. I don't know, but his didn't make it on it, and I had to tell him. I, I went to the Muppet Green Room one day when we were working, and I said to everybody there, oh, I couldn't. Couldn't put your quote on the book, and I'm so sorry, Jerry. And he was okay with it. Um, but somebody said, I wonder what China has against Jerry Nelson. <laughs> so here's Jerry's story. 1960, My Life in the Alternate Universe, Part 2. In 1960, I was doing my second season of acting apprenticeship at Gateway Playhouse in Bellport, Long Island. There was a girl there named Cynthia Lasky. In the course of talking, drugs came up, and she asked me if I'd like to take some peyote. So after a Sunday performance, we cleaned some dry buttons, chewed the vile-tasting things, and washed them down with beer. We drove somewhere in her car and at some point started feeling sick. Her in the front seat and me in the back, we parked somewhere quiet and talked about feeling sick, moaned and laughed about feeling sick, and then started joking about feeling sick. (laughs) We decided some food might settle our stomachs and went to a diner and had some tea and an English muffin. She said she felt better. I said I still felt bad and wanted to go back to the dorm at the theater. She dropped me off and proceeded off into the night on her trip, which she later told me got better and better. We decided three things, to do it again the next week, and this time, We would break up the dried buttons, put them in capsules, and not wash them down with beer, but cola, and get a motel room to ride out the nausea part of the trip. All these were carried out the following Sunday. Thank you, John. Coming up a little later, we will hear a song from Jerry Nelson. Now back to the show. We're back with John Tartaglia. 
And I do think that it, you know, oh, it took it took a little while, but I think you know, people warmed up to us and and uh, kind of accepted us in. And I think it didn't hurt that Kevin was using us as for Elmo's assists, like a lot. He yes. Did, he, yes, a lot for Elmo's world. You would be his right hand, and I would do like yeah. the feet, right? Yeah. And we got to get a lot of on camera experience and a lot of oh, yeah. just assisting experience there on just the watching, you know, just watching yeah. how. I always say that it, it's funny. I think that there's a fear when you're a new puppeteer. I see this in a lot of, a lot of sets. There's a fear of being in the way or a fear of watching. And I always say, I think I learned, you know, 30% from doing and 70% from watching Yeah. because, because you have to understand how this all fits together and that it's not just about you that like in the moment, it feels like that, background character or that right hand or that whatever you're doing is that's all that's in the frame. But, but we, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. we've all been there, right? Where you're yeah. like, you're like, Oh my God, this penguin. If, oh my God, <laughs> I have to get it right. And then you realize yeah. like, Oh no, wait, wait, wait. Mm. that's not what the director's looking at. He's looking at the full picture. Oh, okay. He's worried about the lighting design. Okay. Like you, you, yeah. you have to sit and watch how that works. So on Fraggle Rock, like, uh, you know, in Calgary, we had, um, I want to say 15, people who had never done television puppetry before, who this is their first big wow. thing. Wow. And, and, you know, they'd been auditioned, they passed it, and they were wonderful, but, like, they needed that, that, that experience. And I was so thankful that they would sit and watch and just wanted to learn, because that's just how you absorb it, you know? And, and you can't, that's something you can't learn by yourself in your basement or with your friends yeah. or watching a documentary. You have to just go through that and experience it. You're right, John. You know, whether you're wanting to do it, whether you're wanting to be a puppeteer, or whether you're wanting to just understand what it is that we do, you know, people <laughs> yeah. will, people will say like, "Yeah, I understand. It's puppets and it's TV," and then you say, "No, no, come to the set and watch what it is that we do," and they get yeah. to the set and they go, "Oh, this is what you got. How do you what? This is it. it I can't. Oh, you know, they they don't." get it until they get it. They don't no. see it until people, they see People it. still picture, I think even with TV puppetry, it's so funny. You'd think by now with all the years of Muppets and all the years of everything else that have been out there, <laughs> but people still, I think, picture a television puppet set. I think they just think that there's someone standing behind a sheet, like a birthday party, <laughs> and, and yeah. the camera just like doesn't show them. I think that, and I, and I get it. I get why they think that. But it's yeah. always funny to me, to, like something that's so second nature to us now, Mm -hmm. It's funny to watch people go, oh, you know, and I, and I constantly hear people say, well, where do you hide? And I'm like, oh, well, we're below the frame. And I describe it. Yeah. And they're like, you're not like, huh. you're like, like, you're like behind them. Like, and I'm like, no, I'm, we're like, it, it makes total sense to me. But yeah. then I realized like, this is not normal to anyone else. We have, this is normal to us. <laughs> yeah. It's normal it to us, not to anybody else. We <laughs> yeah. Well, and it happens when you go to somebody else's show too, and you do something like, we're going to put, uh, we're going to put Kermit, uh, in uh, behind the piano, inside the piano. I'm like, well, but if you put Kermit outside the piano and in front, and then you just have the frame cut him off, it'll be so much more magical. It'll be so much better. And they go, and then I it's don't like, understand. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then you show them and then they go, okay, all right. Yes, let's do that. It's it's crazy, yeah, but it, it is. We we know it because we we live it, and most people don't. Well, and you learn again, like you you learn the the tricks that are, become second nature to you, you know, and you learn that, like, you know, there's 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 already been a lot of mistakes made in the past. People learn from the mistakes, right? So you so you take what you take what someone else has failed at, and you go, okay, that didn't work. So what we learned works is this. Yeah. And, and it's like, you know, you don't try to reinvent the wheel. You try to like keep the wheel spinning <laughs> forward right. in a better way. You yeah. Know? In a better and, way. Yeah. Get some better tires. That's right. Get yeah. some better tires, That's you know, right. but yeah. Um, can you talk about Kevin Clash? Kind of a mentor to you, I would say. Very much so. I mean, I think, you know, Kevin um, was like the, the big brother that just like, you know, and I'm so thankful for this, like never let me just do okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, uh, when, and I'm sure, I'm, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm going to assume you had this experience. Like when Kevin handed out uh, a compliment, you knew it was because you really did above and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't, he didn't say just like easily like, great job, you know, <laughs> right. no, that's right. you wanted, you wanted of to course. know you were doing okay. Um, yeah. And, and on the flip side, like, you know, would come over and, and <laughs> push my head down because my head was oftentimes <laughs> no. in shot or, yeah. or, you know, if I 
we did a great take where everyone else was looking fantastic and I screwed up, you know, would lovingly be like, what's wrong with you and smack you, you know, and be like, come on. <laughs> right. But yeah. Come on. What I love is like, he was, he was hard about it, but it was, it was all in service of the work, yes. you know, and it was all about, you know, making this, even if it was an insert about the letter G and it was three lambs running through screaming. I mean, I'm just making it up, but like yeah. it could be something that ridiculous, but it was about making it the best it could possibly be. And I think what I take away from my time working with Kevin was like, every frame is important. Every, every minute, every second of footage is just as important, whether it's, you know, Miss Piggy singing a song center stage, or it's your Penguin 74 in the back. Like, yeah, it all, it all counts. It all matters. It's all vital. And, and I think that level of like the best only sticks with you. And it's like, you're always looking at that and you always have this, um, Larry Merkin, you know, one of the original producers on Fraggle Rock always says, you know, you're, we're all in service of the idea. And I love that. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the best mm -hmm. way to say it. And I think that's definitely what, what Kevin ingrained in me as a performer. But was also, I have to say, like, the flip side of that is, or in addition to that, is that I feel like Kevin gave us shots. Like, yeah. like looking back, you know, we're laughing about the Kingston crew, but that's a perfect example. Like, it was our first season on the show as, yeah. as quote-unquote, full-time assistants. You know, we're brand new. We didn't have any experience as, at that point, as character puppeteers. Yeah. And he picked two unknowns to to go with alice who also was the first one to say that she was still figuring out what she did and who i know she was i know which i can't believe but anyway <laughs> why well, not because she's absolutely brilliant but but you know and and i feel like that says so much about that was what those days were where it was like you know this could have fallen on its face in front of a studio full of you know people who needed to get the show done you mm -hmm. know one of us could have had a panic attack and ran off the set i don't know but like mm -hmm. he saw something in us and trusted us and gave us this, ma this major opportunity. And I, that's always stuck with me. And I feel so grateful yeah. for that. Thinking back on that, he wasn't going to let us fail. Right. You know, because right. he was there. He was there with us. So yes. he was going to walk us through it and get us through it. You know, he, yeah. it would have been different had it just been like crew three and he wasn't even there that day. That would have been like, you know, you're on your own, kids. Good luck. Yeah. This was, this was he was watching over us and, and making sure that we got through the day. It was true mentor support. And I'm so, uh, to your point, I'm so grateful for that because it could have been exactly what you just said. It could have just been like, uh, I'm going to throw you to the wolves and, yep. you know, hopefully you guys don't die. Good luck. And, and it, you know, <laughs> yeah, I gotta, I gotta <laughs> and, go. and it really, it, and I will say, I feel like everyone did that. Like, I feel like Carmen was always giving little mm -hmm. sweet hints to things. And, you know, um, even, yeah. even like, you know, like Sonia, you know, as Maria would like, you know, I remember one time she was like, you know, honey, if you, if you don't put your hand there, but you put it there, then I can get my foot in there, you know, because I was like under a desk behind the fix-it shop or something like that. And, yeah. I was, and I'm sure that was her lovely way of being like, hi, dear, I can't walk and I need you to move your hand so I can walk. But it, yeah. but it was like, it was that loving support from everybody and the directors and everybody. I feel like it was just, we, and I think we came in at a time where there was a, there was like, it was like, we were like saved by the bell, the freshman class, you know, like we were like, <laughs> we were like the new, the new yeah. cast members that were being welcomed in to join these legends. And our job was just to kind of support it and do what we couldn't get out of the way, you know? Yeah. Oh my gosh, John, so many sen <laughs> Sesame and Henson and other puppeteering credits that you've done over the years. I'm going to try to, I'm going to run through these really quickly and I'm going to leave intentionally leave one off that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Okay. Uh, of course, Sesame Street, and we, uh, you did some stuff on Wobulous World of Dr. Seuss. Yeah, that was uh, my other big job, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Animal Jam? Yep, Animal Jam, mm-hmm. That was, uh, you, did you do that in Florida? Was, yes, was that, was my, and that was my, and that was my, uh, yeah, that's a whole other story. I moved myself to Disney World on my own because I wanted to work on that. I literally stayed at a Disney resort for three months. What? I yes. didn't know that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we shot it at, uh, at what was oh. then D Disney MGM Studios, and it was my first time working like a long stretch with Leslie Carraro Rudolph and with Ricky Boyd and, and mm. Heather Ash and such an incredible, incredible group. Oh my gosh. Uh, play with me Sesame. You were Ernie yes. in season two. That was horrifying. Yes. 
<laughs> we'll keep going. Uh, Bear in the Big Blue House. You did Bear in the Big. You did stuff on that. Uh, uh, yeah, just just little background things. Yes. Right. El- Elmo Palooza. We were we did that oh, yeah. thing, that crazy thing with John Stewart as the host. Yeah, remember that? That was fun. Yeah, that was crazy. Of course, Elmo's World Between the Lions. Yes. Yes. Uh, Elmo the Musical, which is mm-hmm. pretty fun. Speaking of Elmo the Musical. You know, you started on Sesame, but you landed on Broadway somehow in this in this journey. Uh, yes. And there was a bit of a process to get there. And of course, yes. I'm talking about Avenue Q, which you were yes. nominated for a Tony Award for. But yeah. how, how did Avenue Q, and we'll try to, because man, we're, we're talking, uh, we're going deep on everything here. But let's try I to say it. like, Avenue Q, how did that start for you? And how did that go from off-Broadway uh, at the Vineyard? Was it at the Vineyard? The Vineyard, yeah. Yeah. To then Broadway. How did that happen? I'll give you the short version. The short version is, um, uh, you know, working at Sesame Street, and Stephanie DeBruzzo, the amazing Stephanie DeBruzzo and I were always talking about musical theater, our love for musical theater. And, you know, when I wasn't doing Sesame Street, I was, you know, on the off season or whenever I could, I was always auditioning for theater. I still wanted to pursue that. I still wanted to, I dreamt of doing Broadway too. That was like my, my second dream, you know, was like working uh. on Broadway. I wanted to be a Broadway performer. Um, so I would do, I did like a, a theater works tour, like a kid's tour. I would, I did a bunch of like off, off, off Broadway shows, Swamp Fever. There's a show that no one talks about, um, <laughs> you know, and, and just uh-huh. like, I was always doing something musical theater. And so uh, Rick Lyon, and then of course, an amazing puppeteer and puppet builder who worked on Sesame Street, um, knew about that, that my love of that. And so mm-hmm. he got associated with Jeff Marks and Bobby Lopez, who were the composers of Avenue Q. And Jeff had worked as a music intern on Sesame Street. And to his own storytelling, did not, did not do well and got fired. <laughs> um, oh, and, but he and Bobby were both huge Muppet fans. They wanted to create things for the Muppets. That didn't work out. They're like, let's just write our own show with puppets. And they were, the original intention was the show was going to be like a Comedy Central-esque television series it wasn't going to be a theater piece it was going to be a television oh. series um and i'm like a crank anchor is what a crank anchors yeah. ended up being and uh so they asked if i was available to do this because of rick lyon and laura mclean wonderful laura mclean mm-hmm. um who also recommended me they asked you know would you do this reading of of this show and it's going to be a tv show but it's like we have like four skits and four or five songs and it's one night, and this is why I always tell people to listen to that little voice inside of you, because I had paid work booked that night. I think I was like, it was the off season, I think, at Sesame Street. I think I was catering or something. There was something I was doing that was going to make some money I needed. Yeah. But but something inside of me was like, this is cool. Like, I wanted to do it, you know? And I yeah. just said yes without even thinking about it. I said, yeah, sure. And so we did this reading of the show. at the It was at the York Theater, and I will never forget – that night because Jen Barnhart was in the audience who has the most distinct and most wonderful <laughs> laugh on God's green earth. Thank God. Yeah. Her laugh yeah. is so beautifully present. I mean, literally yeah. if you want to laugh her, bring Jen Barnhart to your show. Bring Jen Bar- yeah, um, yeah, that's right. And so we did this reading and what happened was we accidentally, because we're like, well, we're, we're not going to be on TV. We're standing in front of a bunch of people in a theater. So, you know, normally we'd hold our puppets up high right above our heads, but it just felt like for that long of a night, it was silly to do that. So we just kind of held them out in front of us and something accidentally about watching us with the puppets is what turned it into a theater piece. And then the, wow. our producers happened. One of our producers happened to be there that night, Robin Goodman, who saw it and said, this has to be a theater piece. And so that started it. And so basically we did a ton of readings, a ton of workshops. It was, and I was, my joke is it's true is I was always like ready to be replaced by like Neil Patrick Harris. So I was like, they're going to get, they're, they're never going to keep me. Cause I was this like unknown young puppeteer, like, you know, um, and we kept doing it, kept doing it. And then we somehow got our off Broadway production and did the off Broadway production. I remember, I think it was like a five week run or something like that. And I just thought, great, we did it. Like we got it where it was going to go. Right. It was seven people, yeah. one set. Like it was, you could have never told me it was going to be a Broadway show. And it was like, but we sold out. We became the cool thing. Celebrities started coming to see it downtown. It was like, it became a thing. And then we had a meeting and they said, we're moving to Broadway. So it was just, it was just, you know, Anna Harada, who played Christmas Eve in the original, always used to call it. I think Stephanie did too. We were like the little show that could. We were like the Cinderella story. And it just kept, it was like, it was unbelievable. It was just, you know, it was just so weird. And then what I think is still really cool is the fact that then you're in Little Shop of Horrors on Broadway yeah. There are all my puppet friends like down the yeah, street. A, like we yeah. happen to be on the same season. Like how crazy Insane. was that? I know. So 
Yeah, it was a magical, that was just a, it was such a, a, another kind of magical meant to be thing that just happened. And I just, you know, I really do, I really was ready to be fired all the time. I was like, they're going to get rid of me. I am not, at that point, I had no legit theater experience, I mean, real Broadway experience, so. Well, you know, somebody sent a message. You mentioned, you mentioned her just a second ago, but uh, (gasps) somebody did send you a message that I want to play for you right now. Here we go. I remember meeting baby Johnny Tartaglia when he was 16 years old, first on the set of Sesame Street, and then later at the Wubulous World of Dr. Seuss, he came to assist us, and he was still in high school, and he was so young and fresh-faced, and he was very clearly talented, but he was just so excited to be there and happy to work with us and happy to do whatever. You tell him to do the most mundane thing in the background or right hand or the most thankless job. He was so happy. Yes, yes, of course. And I remember talking to him and I was still relatively new at the time. I'd been there only about three years. And I remember him talking to me and saying, wow, Stephanie, you know, someday I want to be just like you. And I... (laughs) at that point was already grizzled enough to say to him, Johnny, you don't want to be like me. (laughs) (laughs) And thankfully, he is not like me. He can buy and sell me. He has zoomed to the very top of everything. And um, we are all so proud of him. Uh, Oh, my goodness. Yeah. He, He is a big, shiny, L.A., and Toronto producer, and all of his dreams have come true, and he's busy, and he's doing exactly what he wants, and I, I just could not be prouder of him. And and even still, even with him being all big shoddy, whenever I see him, it's, it's like old times, and I am so happy to have gone on so many adventures with you, Johnny T. I will say one more thing very quickly. I used to joke that you couldn't ever play a board game with Johnny because if he rolled an eight and was moving his game piece around the board, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, he'd go da 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 Okay. <laughs> I love you, Johnny T. Oh my God. That is so <laughs> emotional. She's right uh, though. I mean I I I what's funny is I still feel like whenever I work with Stephanie, I'm just like, oh, that's okay, that's the master. Like, you know, it's like, I, I still have that relationship with her when I watch her work and I'm like, oh my God, like I want to be as good as Stephanie DeBruzzo. So that that's a, that means a lot to hear that from her. But yeah, Web of This World was a big, that was a big part of, I mean, as much as Sesame Street was a, a huge part of my first year mm-hmm. in New York, Web of This World was really big. Because yeah. that was like a brand new show where you saw the stakes of like, it's got to work out. And you had this right. mix, yeah. mix of puppeteers that were like, and, and, you know, that's where I met Craig Shemin, Stephanie's wonderful yeah. husband, who was the writer on that show. And um, I remember Kathy Mullen was one of the puppeteers in that show. Can you hear me by the way? They're doing work. Of course they're I, doing work outside my window today, because that's <laughs> what happens when you try that's to do a happens. podcast. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's okay. Right. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Um, Kathy Mullen was uh, working on what this world was the puppet captain, you know, and of course, Oh my God, Moki from Fraggle Rock, right? Yeah. Like, and I remember being so <laughs> fanboy, like so, like she would ask me to do something, I'd be like, okay, like I could barely <laughs> speak. I was so excited. And I remember one day she said to me in a very, at the time it kind of crushed me, and I told her the story, but it, I'm so thankful that she said it. She said, one day she said, Johnny, you've got to stop being such a fan. And I was like, uh, huh? And she's like, she's like, you're part of the family now. She's like, stop being such a fan. And it, all I heard at the time was, stop being such a fan. Oh, my God, she hates right, me. <laughs> but, of course, what she was saying so lovingly was, okay, you got here. Like, you're here you're now, here. Yeah. and we're including you, so you don't need to tell me about episode 74 <laughs> Fraggle Rock. Like, I know, I did it. Like, now just yeah. focus on the work. You're here. And I'm so uh, grateful she said that, because that was, that was a very, like, eye-opening moment for me of, like, oh, okay, it's okay. But anyway, yeah, I learned a lot on that show. That was, that was a big part of my first year in new york city for sure oh gosh and then you know you've you just like you said before you've always been interested in theater musical theater in particular right so yes. you 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 made it to broadway your second yes. dream your first yes. dream was to get to sesame street your second dream was to go to broadway you did both i know and then you I didn't know. just do 
Avenue Q, you did Shrek, you did Beauty yep. and the Beast. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then you also directed stage. You, you, and you have uh, directed yeah. stage and theater pieces uh, all over the country, really, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is crazy too, John. You wrote, and, you wrote and you created John Tartaglia's Imagine Ocean, which was an off-Broadway show yes. in New York City. I did not over. want to put my name over it, by the way. I did not. Well, Oh come on! I didn't. No, I really didn't. I, no, no, no. And I say that because because it I, it still makes me cringe every time I see it because I was like, but the marketing people were like, no, 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 no. This is good. I was like, I don't. Of course. I know. I you know what? It. That's really funny. Is when I was writing the notes for this, I I because I remembered Imagine Ocean. And I was like Imagine Ocean, and then I looked it up, and then it said very specifically John Tartaglia's Imagine Ocean. I'm like, oh, okay. I'll put John Tartaglia's Imagine Ocean here. But I get that. You know, I understand from the PR point of view. Yeah, you, I can you were, see it. You had just been nominated for a Tony. You were in a big. Broad yeah. Yeah. show yeah put his name on it but I, I get just, your I, I just don't you know I like the work to speak for itself and I and I of just course. was like I was like oh my god I'm never gonna hear the end of this um but <laughs> but yeah no that was that was such a yeah that kind of moved Imagine Ocean really moved me into the creative the creation part of my career where I wasn't mm-hmm. just performing in someone else's work I was starting to starting to get interested in creating my own. And I never really thought I would, I would, could do that. I never thought I was good enough to do that. I never, I never had that confidence to write or to direct it mm. or to, you know, and, and that was really the show that kind of changed that for me and started to give me that, 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 um, open my mind to that, that that was a possibility as well. Yeah, so that was the first time that you kind of created this show from nothing. From, from a, yeah, from literally from scratch. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, it's funny, I, I, I had written things for fun. I'd written sketches and fun little things like that, but never yeah. at, a, at a high level. And um, when they said, well, when the whole process of imagination happened, they were like, well, you can write it. I was like, really? <laughs> and, and I did. And, it, and I, looking back, there's things I would, I'm like, oh, I would so redo that and change that. And oh my God. But, you know, at the time, it was the first thing I ever wrote that was legit. And I was really, yeah. I'm really proud of it. You know, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was a, it was a big it was a big change for me. It was like, oh wait, there's something joyful about making your own thing, and and creating your own vision and seeing something in your head and then getting it brought to life on stage or on set. Like that was just a different experience yeah. for me. But and you that you didn't stop there. You didn't <laughs> stop. You didn't just stop creating. Just say I'm just going to do one thing. Yeah. Uh, then I mean I don't know what the timeline is here, but that but you also then did a TV show. Yes. Johnny and the Sprites for Playhouse yes. Disney. Now. Again, did did you you created that show? Did you have a creator that created it with you? You created it. So so I created it with uh, <laughs> so a, a few other wonderful people, uh, Luis Gico and Daryl Watson and Michael Schubach and Joel Gluckson. Um, but we the idea initially was mine. But what's funny is I was not in it. So what happened was oh. is uh, the president of Disney Channel at the time, Rich Ross. Oh my God, they are hyping up the. <laughs> of course, they're cutting. You hear it? Is it awful? A little bit. It's okay. No, it's. Do you want me to move? I can move. You want me to move? No, you don't move. You tell them to move. No, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Oh it's my okay. god! The visual for those listening right now is they're of course <laughs> like choosing today to trim the trees outside of my apartment building. Of course they are. It's um, fine. This is real life, John. It's okay. That's this is what, real life. That's what would happen. It's what's know. going on. Don't adjust right. your sets. It's not no, happening it's, in your it's world. Okay. <laughs> it's no, it's here. fine. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, wait, they stopped. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. So basically, uh, uh, Rich Ross, who was president at Disney Channel, came to see Avenue Q. And um, one thing I am not known for is being really organized. I am good at a lot of things. Organization is one I fight all the time. So I say that to say he sent me this beautiful letter. The president of the Disney Channel <laughs> sent me a letter that said, I would like to meet with you and discuss ideas and I literally put it on my dressing room station at Avenue Q. To be fair, it was like around the Tonys. It was a crazy time. Oh, yeah. But it, it, I mean, it was probably there. insane. Yeah. <laughs> it was insane. So. But I should have maybe returned that <laughs> quickly. And oh, I didn't God. respond. And to his credit, he could have been like, well, forget you. Uh, like a month later, he wrote me again and said, maybe you didn't get my first letter. <laughs> but I would <laughs> like to talk with you. So I finally responded. We went to dinner. And... He was just asking me about my work on Sesame Street, working about my career, and then he said, um, "How would you feel about making a show for us for Disney Channel?" And I remember I was like, "Wait, what?" Like, I, it it was like my brain couldn't process that because you know I always dreamt of like what it would be like to have my own TV show, but I felt like when I'm in my 60s and I win the lottery, <laughs> I like you know I just make a show, you know. Yeah. I never thought about actually doing it and pursuing that, and so. But then also, it was for Disney. 
which you're which a big like, Disney fan. I was like, ah, like it was like the heavens <laughs> opened up, right? And yeah. um, I had, I, I had when I was 16, my dad used to play at a summer camp, music at a summer camp. And I would sit there and just draw and write ideas because I was, you know, I was there just to be with him. And I remember writing down this idea for this, for this, uh, these creatures, these sprites living in a forest. I think I had written down the names Ginger and Basil. I don't know why I thought that was funny, but I think because they were sprites and I thought it was like spices and, and I, and I, and I wrote like some basic ideas and put it, you know, and left on a notebook that I happened to keep in my closet. And I remember in that moment when he said that, that was the only thing that came to my head. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I think I have a couple ideas. And he's like, well, you know what? Like come in and pitch them to our, to our group. And he set up a meeting with me, Nancy Cantor, who was the president of television at the time. And I panicked. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And, um, Somehow at that time, I, I started talking with, with Jill Lux and Louise Gico and Michael and all these people. And we came up with, you know, the basic concept for it. And Jill is the one, Jill is the one who was like, you need to be in it. And I was like, wait, what? Like, it never occurred to me. It was just going to be like, like, a, like a Fraggle Rock-esque show where it was just going to be like adventurous, magical puppets that lived in another world. I had no, there was no humans in it at the time. And Jill was like, no, he came to see you at Avenue Q. He likes you as a performer. You need to be in it. And so I, I'm very thankful she said that. And so then it became Johnny and the Sprites. And I, we presented it, and then it happened. So it was just like, it was such a, uh, another kind of magical moment. And, you know, it was, it was scary because I was, at the time, I was 26. And I was in charge of, you know, a TV show that I was on, but also like yeah. the creator and executive producer of co-executive producer. Oh. So it was like, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from that. And, and I, it That's was the amazing. most wonderful group of people. And we had such oh, yeah. fun. We had such fun. You had, you had Carmen Osbar, you had Leslie Carr Rudolph, mm-hmm. Tim Legasse, Heather Ash, Jim Krupa, oh, Jim Krupa. Oh my gosh. Jim Krupa. Lisa Buckley, Jen Barnhart, Jeez. Jamie Donmore. Like it was such an incredible group of performers. Unbelievable. So now this is the second thing that you've created then, right? That, that then became yeah. the second, and that was pretty big. That was on, how, how many, how long did you run? The, well, the, we did, we did seasons? a series of shorts that were like five minute shorts that were, they were really kind of like the tests for it, for it. It was like, yeah. okay, we'll do these like little interstitials, they called them. And we'll see if, if people like them. And if so, then we'll do the series. So we did five interstitials and then that got greenlit and we did two seasons. Oh my so, gosh. yeah. And that was also the first time, you know, it's funny with the show, when the show got canceled, after the second season, that was the first time something major like that had been lost. Like I had experienced mm-hmm. that kind of where it was where it wasn't a show you were working on that was someone else's dream and vision. It was like your thing yeah. that gets that gets told no. And that was that was really hard. That was a hard time because it happened, and then Shrek the musical happened, and then that didn't. We weren't incredibly successful. Yeah. We only ran for like a year, and then that closed so it was kind of like two big whammies in my life that were so important to me at the same time so oh and i'm and i'm glad because it, it i really think you need to have those super low moments when you've had so many highs i mean i felt like it, i was like okay this is this is coming to me because it was like a, i've had this incredible <laughs> yeah. journey yeah. and when's the other shoe life. gonna drop yeah yeah that's and what it was i like, there think. it is yeah me too yeah. right it's like it's like and now once you've had that in a good way and bad way, in a good way, it makes you so much savor the good so much more, and it makes you so much more aware of the good, but it also always, behind you, there's always this, like, little, it's like, demon over your shoulder of, like, uh, of, like yeah, it's gonna, gonna make this away. really good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I could take it away. Uh, you know, yeah. and here's a little thing that I remember, and I this, like, popped into my head. I remember in the mid-2000s, John, seeing a commercial... Uh, remember when we had to watch commercials when they were on television <laughs> yes, and there we was a commercial for, yeah, there was a commercial for Kmart yes. and you were, <laughs> and I was like, that voice sounds so familiar to me. Oh my gosh. I who's was the, the voice, voice in that little blue light? That was me. That was, was me. You. I, it was the weirdest. Mo- it was so funny. That job, Steven DeAngelis called me in for that job. Amazing casting director. Uh, and he was like, <laughs> he was, he was very kind of like, uh, like a, like a straight shooter. I remember he was like, he was like, don't do a character, just do your voice, just do your voice. And I was like, okay. And like, you know, I'd gone, on, I was auditioning for commercials and for voiceovers and stuff. And you know, so often you're putting on a, a character or a voice or whatever. Yeah. And they just wanted someone who's, I guess, sounded like me. And it was so, it felt so naked to like not do a <laughs> right. voice. Like I was just like, hey, it's Martha Stewart Sheets on sale for twelve ninety nine. This, <laughs> and it felt so weird. And 
somehow I got the job and I did it for like five years. That's some, and it was that's some nice stuff. Can, you know, commercial stuff is uh, that's it's good, a great residuals job. The only thing that's hard is creatively. I this is why I think it, it takes a certain. I admire people who do it all their lives because when you're not doing animation, I think animation and and that kind of voiceover is wonderful because it's all creative. But when you're doing commercial voiceover, it's so much about like the way it has to be said and the little specificities to help sell it. And I remember sitting in that booth sometimes and just like, there would be like a half hour debate about saying and or but, you know, (laughs) or like, you know, or like you'd like say the line and then it'd be like, say it one more time, but a little bit more like this. And you'd be like, like, just do that. But like, that's your job. Your job is just to do it. And and I'm so grateful for the work. It was an incredible job, but it was also just like, it, it definitely showed me that like, Oh yeah. Like there's so much thought that goes into just like how you say 1299 you know, yeah. or Martha Stewart sheets or Martha yeah. Stewart sheets, Martha Stewart and, sheets. And like, the <laughs> chain of approvals. So oh my many gosh. people have to approve before you're like, I think we got that. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it was just like, you know, and, and but it, it did become kind of this wonderful regular gig that I'm so grateful. It paid the bills during some, some leaner times. And, mm. you know, it, it, it makes me respect again, like, you know, you never think about the art and the time and the heart and the, and the dedication that goes into something like a commercial, but yeah. it made me it completely changed my awareness of that. And so whenever I watch a TV commercial now, I think about how many times did they say that line? How many times did the director <laughs> want right. that shot? How many different day. colors did they go through before they pick <laughs> that color? You know, it's That's right. It's, yeah. It's a different world. Speaking of worlds, I don't know. I was, I'm trying a segue. <laughs> that was good. Uh, but so you gathered people and from the worlds of the Muppets, from the worlds of the Jim Henson company and from the world of Sesame street, you gathered them all together at yes. Carnegie hall yeah, Jim Henson's magical world. I remember being there for that. I that was so much fun. And, I'm so and, glad it was fun because I, oh. Craig and I, Craig Shemin, who co-conceived it with me, we were so like there. I remember it was like I don't think I slept for like three <laughs> weeks. I really don't because I felt such responsibility of like making everyone happy and oh. you know. And there were all these rules when you work at Carnegie Hall. There's mm-hmm. all these rules like you can't have set pieces. And if you yep, do, it's like, a, it's a huge amount of money if you bring in set pieces that we couldn't afford. So uh, it was like, we had to like, God bless all of you, that everyone agreed to puppeteer behind like drum baffles with like, yeah. I mean, it was, I felt so like Mickey and Judy putting on a show in their garage with like a bird's <laughs> nest in the rack. Like it was so, but what was amazing was everyone again was in service of the idea of honoring Jim and, yeah. and all that beautiful music. And it was just kind of like, Muppet Family Christmas is still my absolute favorite. I would I venture to that. say it's my right. I think it's. I yes. think it's. I think it's one of, if not the best thing that was ever done, because it it just was the right humor and the right heart, and it was all these different properties coming together, and it was mm-hmm. it really felt like a family, and and Craig and I, I was working with the Legacy at the time, um, which is the best group of people in the world, and and I was just like, have, has this ever happened since then? Like. You know, it was it was such an idea of just like, could we do this again? Could we use music to reunite all the worlds? Because this is also what this is 2011 or 12, I want to say. Yeah, I can't remember the exact year, but you know, Muppets at that point had gone to Disney. You know, mm-hmm. Henson still owned the Fraggles and Emmett Otter, those characters, and Sesame Street. I think had just taken over the Sesame Street characters. I'm, I'm getting my time a little somewhere, confused, but. somewhere in there. But yeah, they were all now each individual. They were all individual companies owned by you know they owned their own properties. Yeah, it had never this kind of grouping hadn't happened. I believe but since probably since Jim passed away at, at his I memorial. Right. I think that's the last yeah. time those characters were done. So it was very scary and emotional and like exciting. And it, the Fraggles had just been rebuilt for the, the Ben Folds five concert or video, I think. So they were, they hadn't really been in the world since then. And, yeah. um, and the Emmett puppets had just been built for the Emmett Otter, wonderful Emmett Otter production of a good speed. So it was just like, it was such a great, and Paul Williams was there. And, and oh I mean, you guys were there and I mean, it was just, I just, I look back at that and I just, I don't know how we did it. But it was, and to have that music played by, you know, that glorious orchestra. I I just, I just, uh, it was magical. And Jerry Nelson was there. That was Um, the best part because he wasn't able to puppeteer at that time, mm -hmm. but he came and saw it with Jane Henson and, and he did the voiceover. He did like the intro, like his, you know, his, his go-to announcer voice, which I love. And that made it feel very like, I I don't know, complete, I guess would be the word. Yeah. Yeah, that was super special. 
Stepping away from my interview with John Tartaglia for a few minutes for a song from Jerry Nelson. Our song today is called Drunk, and there is a great full band version of it on Jerry's album Truro Daydreams. But today, we get to hear a one-track demo that Jerry recorded of the song. So here's Drunk. Take it away, Jerry. Gin is divine, make you feel so fine Until you start stepping out of time Don't need a tonic, don't need a line Drink it straight till it's too late And you're drunk You're drunk You're drunk You're drunk Woke up in the alley, I was feeling bad Somebody took everything I had Believe me when I tell you I was staggering mad When the cop showed up I wish I had not been drunk I'm drunk I was drunk I was drunk Yeah, I'm in the tank with myself to thank Heard the keys jingle and a lockbook clank Sitting on a bunk with my head in a funk and Trying to figure out why I got Yeah, that's right Drunk, all drunk. Bought the whiskey, tequila, beer. Think you see everything real clear until you hit that one, put you over your weight. You be dancing and groove until it's too late, and you're drunk, all drunk. You're drunk. So save your money, take my advice you liver will love you, you feel twice as nice But when I get some money, I know what I'll do I'll go to some bar and I'll horse a few And get what? That's right, drunk I get drunk I get drunk I'll drunk Thanks, Jerry. We have one more Jerry song and story left this season on Below the Frame, so keep an ear out for that. We're back with John Tartaglia. Well, let's talk about, we mentioned Jim Henson Company, but you've done a lot of work with Jim Henson Company. Yes. Uh, over, the, over the many years. And a lot of stuff is, is new, new stuff, new properties, yeah. things that you've created, splash and bubbles. Right? Yeah, I didn't realize that it was that it was based on uh, Imagine Ocean, but now I get it. Okay, I was just like, he really yeah. likes fish and water. I, you know, but- it was. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do love snorkeling. That's true. That's actually where Imagine Ocean came from was from snorkeling. But that is that uh-huh. is the Splash and Bubbles was the was the it was going to be called Imagine Ocean, but up until the last minute, and then they're like, parents don't know how to Google. <laughs> how to spell imagination right. okay, but can we just right, call fine. it something simpler yeah <laughs> i get it now looking back i'm like yeah all right, that's a good idea right, so you created that show and you were vo- the voice of splash and that 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 show did that show use the hdps it did system? and i was so scared because what happened was we came out to la to pitch it to Henson. At the time, I wasn't working with the Jim Henson Company. This is before Word Party, which was, which was my first oh, oh. series back with Henson after I left to do Broadway and, and some other projects. Um, so I'd never done the HGPS system before. And again, another amazing magical occurrence of events. I We met with Lisa Henson in her office and told her she had known about the show. Um, Hallie Stanford, who's the president of television at Henson, had, had seen Imagine Ocean, knew about it, and she was, God love her, she was the one who was like, yeah, come on in, let's, let's, let's talk about it. And we'd worked together on Animal Jam years before. So we had a shared history. Um, anyway, so we're sitting in Lisa's office. I'm picturing the show. I'm like, well, it's fish and that. And she's like, she's like, you know, she's like, I wonder if our HGPS system would be a good way to, to bring it to life. And I thought, that sounds cool. I didn't know a lot about it. I'd never done it before. And then she's like, you know, we're doing this project 
for the Georgia Aquarium, and it's a fish, and I think it's on the stage right now, and it's HTPS. Let's just go try it out. And I was like, oh. And okay. so I literally, my first introduction to HTPS, and while I'm pitching the show, Lily, it was going on stage with Lisa and Hallie and putting my hand in these controls, which are insane. Oh I mean, it's, it's like, it's like a, it's a whole other art form. You know, it's like teaching a marionettist how to do, you know, plumbing. <laughs> it's like, it's so <laughs> right. different. Yeah, it's very different. Same idea as you're using your hands, but so different. <laughs> and I put my hands in there and thank God I could get the basic, you know, the basic functions. I mean, the fish did not look great, <laughs> but it was enough that Lisa was like, oh, you kind of got, you got, a, you got a skill for that. Oh, this could really work. You were thinking of it as a puppet show? or what Well, you yeah, I wasn't sure because, you know, I think, I think I knew at the time, you have to remember this is, too, well, when we pitched it, it was 2000, my God, 13 maybe, I'm going to mm-hmm. guess, when we probably pitched it. And at the time, puppets were a no-no, right? Like there was no, right. there were no puppets on TV except yeah. for Sesame Street, probably. Yeah. And so it was still like everything was animated, everything was CG, that was it. So, I so kinda, you, that's kind of what you were thinking, right? Because initially, figured. Imagine Ocean was the was blacklight puppetry. Yes, right? it was all blacklight, and it was it was it looks different because most pe- a lot of people in America don't know black blacklight puppetry. So yeah. that felt new, and I I, I kind of was trying to pitch that. I was like, maybe it could be like not blacklight puppetry, but like doing it with kind of like animated backgrounds. But it just the world wasn't ready for that at the time for TV. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Lisa said, it sh- you know, it should be animated, which I totally loved the idea of. I love the idea of being able to take animation and take it further, right? But I had no idea about HTTPS. And so, yeah, so we, we went in there and did it. And thank God I didn't fail completely at it in that moment. And that kind of convinced them that it could be an HTTPS series. And then in the meantime, I got called to come do Word Party as Kip, um, which was my very first time walking into HTTPS and, and had a couple weeks to learn it. And it is, oh my gosh. it is the, I, I don't care how good of a puppeteer you are. It is a complete, it is such a challenging thing to do. And it's magical because you're puppeteering animation and you have, it's almost limitless what you can do, but it's so difficult. So that was like being thrown back into the fire. I felt like I was like <sighs> 16 at Sesame street again. I really did. It was like, <laughs> oh, okay. Like all these but amazingly talented. As the user, as the puppeteer, you can choose all of these uh, random, I mean, probably infinite, uh, infinite ideas of like an, an eyebrow raise or yes. eye blinks or w- and which finger does what. It's you up to you, right? You are your own. Yes. So you're you're kind of a combo. You're puppeteering, and you can customize the the the, the machinery essentially to go into the, to read into the computer the way you want it to, right? So some puppeteers will put, for example, this is a bad example, but some puppeteers will put their eyebrow wiggle on their on a foot pedal right and some puppeteers will put that on their a joystick and some puppeteers will put like their like i like i like a good ooh shape right like with, with a puppet uh-huh. mouth so some people put that on, on like a wrist move and other people put it on a finger like oh you gosh. have total customization so that's kind of cool and horrifying and yeah. then the other thing is you are kind of your own animator because you're given a basic f- structure and form of the puppet but then you can go in and adjust how far it moves and how big of an expression it is and how, and you can set up certain things. Like if there's a scene where you know you're going to be angry the whole time, you can put in a setting where it's just all your angry moves. And it's really, it's really cool, but it's scary because you, you're given, so it's not like having a, a puppet on your hand where I can only move the mouth this much. And I can only, if I, you know, but maybe the mouth palette pulls back and I can get a fun little scrunchy face, but that's kind of it. Here you yeah. can do every lip shape, you can do every eye function, you could do blinks, you could do eye rolls, you could do dilated pupils, you can do it's it's really and, and, crazy. And 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 you're doing live vo- voice voice <laughs> yes. lines? Yes. So I always joke it's what? like it's like it's like you know you know Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins means like the the one man band. Yes, it's like yeah. imagine that but having to lip sync and having to do voices at the same time. So it, you're just oh like my gosh. I, But then you know it's funny, it's like playing the piano, <laughs> then you all of a sudden like you know, when you're first starting to play the piano, you're super aware of your right and your left hand and what your foot, foot's doing, right? And then eventually you just kind of trust the music and you follow it. And that's kind of what this is. Like, the first couple times I did it, I was just like, oh my God, oh, uh, like, you know, you're crying almost inside. And then you just kind of, you just follow the story and you follow the, the scene and you just trust your muscle memory. And, and Give I am by it. no means a master of it. I still feel like I'm I'm Oof. very much a newbie with, with it. But it's it's really fun once you start to enjoy that part of of how limitless it is, you know? <laughs> so now we will talk about this thing that we've talked about a little bit, 
And yeah. I mean, it goes all the way back for you, John. It goes all the way back to that thing that you saw that made you go, your mind, you know, the magic and the, how did they do this? I mean, how long have you wanted to do Fraggle Rock? So this is a true story. So when I was uh, growing up, when I was a kid, you know, like I'm going to say like early teen years and, you know, inevitably at like, you know, the family dinner table or, or someone in my life would say, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I would say, well, it doesn't exist anymore. And they'd say, what do you mean? And I'd say, well, I want to be a puppeteer on Fraggle Rock, but it's done. And that's literally what I would want. Um, and, you know, and once I kind of knew the series was done production, I kind of just put it aside and think about it. And then when I started coming out here to work with the Jemensen Company again, and I started developing my relationship with them, um, I was probably as annoying as I was when I was on Sesame Street at 16, <laughs> where my my blind love and optimism of wanting the Fraggles to come back. I just I was like the squeaky wheel. And so I always dreamt in some way that Fraggles would come about. And then um, in 2013, I want to say it was, um, they were bringing back the Fraggles, uh, for the first time to do anything promotional, anything television for what was then the hub network. And I remember the hub network, right. it was like a family network and Jerry, of course, had passed away. And so they needed someone to play Gobo. And so they at knowing that I was this Fraggle obsessed <laughs> person, um, right. they were like, do you want to audition for this? And of course I was like, yes. And I gave and okay, I like I watched it back recently just for fun. I was like, oh my god! Like I, you know, as I'm sure you've done for yourself too. You watch your oh, old course. stuff and you're like, what was I thinking? <laughs> but, yeah. but I, but I, I had the lore in my head and I knew all the, you know, I knew I knew every. I still know every episode of the original series by heart. I could tell you every Fraggle fun fact, every character, every place they went. So I think <laughs> because they knew I had that that in me, they saw. It, and they gave me Gobo. And so I did my very first thing with Karen Prell in 2013. I was, again, I didn't sleep. I was so nervous. And I remember it was like, that. that's when I was like, oh, it's never going to get better than this. I'm standing on a soundstage with Karen Prell, one of my, hero, my puppetry heroes, performing Gobo Fraggle with her as Red Fraggle. It was just the most surreal moment of my life. And she was so supportive. You, you've worked with Karen. The most oh, yeah. lovely wonderful human being on this earth she's so supportive so giving and so as equally in love with the fraggles and yeah and so so that was the beginning of it and then i don't know i always then there was a movie that was going to happen for a while that was in development it was it was kind of like i always kind of hoped like i was like i hope i'll get to do it you know i mean yeah. whether is whether it's gobo or whether it's just anything i would have been happy to be like pink fraggle seven in the back with a radish stick like i just didn't care i was so right. excited to be to do anything fraggle um and then a few years ago we had a, a meeting um so part of my work now is i develop new projects with with henson and so i was invited to a meeting with apple and henson was entering into uh a creative you know f finding ways to work with apple television and the president of the company of, of apple said uh what's going on with Fraggle Rock? And we were like, ding, 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 ding. And <laughs> that's the one. We're like, oh my gosh. And so, yeah, so that that's really where the association started with the characters and Apple. And you, and, you did those yeah. shorts, right? You did the, the, yeah. the six musical shorts? Well, that's what's so funny. So I had the puppets. So you can imagine, right? Now that I'm working at the Jim Henson Company and I'm, I'm so incredibly blessed to now have access to the fraggle lore and the fraggle world i was a bit of a crazy person so we we, sh we shot this <laughs> we shot this uh this unaired promotional thing with the fraggles and they were in my office and uh in my office at henson and in their cases and this is a few weeks before everything shut down during the pandemic and so something and they they told us to, they were like we're not going to work from the offices anymore you're going to work from home so go home i mean you you, know, you can imagine you probably remember such an yeah. uncertain time, right, in the world. It was like, was this going to be a couple of weeks? Was this going to be a month off? Was like, what was going to happen, right? Something mm -hmm. in my gut said to bring those puppets home with me. I don't know why. I think part of me was like, I don't want to leave these, you know, unique, beautiful puppets in my office. You know, what, what could happen to them? So I brought right. them home. And then literally like three weeks later, we get a call from Apple saying, hey, we really want to make some programming for families right now to help with this because it's really confusing for kids. And there, you know, the idea being like, how can we be together even when we're apart was the, was the, how do we make 
how do we make programming for that? And so, yeah, so Holly Stanford and I and Lisa, we all talked and we came up with these ideas of the Fraggle Rock Rock on Shorts. And it was such a, like, a, it was just a, a labor of love. It was like, let's all film this in our bedrooms, you know, all over the, the place. I mean, everyone was filming from different places. You know, Karen was up in Seattle. I, myself and Donna Kimball were here in LA. Frankie Cordero was in Chicago, I think, at the time. You know, Dave was up in, you know, where he is. So it was just, it was this big mix of like, everyone's all over the place. And yeah. Yeah. And then those shorts, we put them up with just out of love and, and did it with, with a lot of fun. And then people loved them. And the reactions were so huge that that kind of, I think, propelled the series to getting to, to moving forward. So it was just kind of like another, like, you know, who knew what was going to happen and it just happened to work out that way. And now finally we have Fraggle Rock back to the rock, which is airing on Apple TV plus. And yes. how many, how many, how, you, all the episodes are released at once. Yes, they all came out on the 21st of January. So 13 wow. episodes. Yeah, we did 13 half hours. So, and you were on this show. What are your higher level positions? I know we, <laughs> you, you did Gobo, and we'll talk about Gobo in yes. just a minute. But what are your higher level positions on the show? You were the executive producer. I was very blessed. Yes, I was the executive producer, uh, one of the executive producers. Um, I was, uh, I played Gobo. I was uh, one of the writers, and I was the puppet captain. So cool. Co-captain uh, by who, the amazing Frank Meshkalite. Frank Meshkalite was our amazing co-captain. Uh, who, who else is on your team of writers and producers that maybe we might know? Oh, gosh. Well, we had, I mean, first of all, what was really amazing, we, we had Jocelyn Stevenson from the original series, um, who is just the most joyous, wonderful human being in the world and so funny. And, you know, the, here's the fun fact is we, we wrote that whole show during the pandemic, right, for, it took seven months, I think, or six months to write all 13 episodes in a writer's room. We would meet every day from like nine to six on Zoom, all of us from all over the country and all over the world, literally. Jocelyn was coming in from England. And so that was really cool. And just we just shared stories and Jocelyn would tell us all these wonderful stories about the making of the original and working with Jim. And it was just it was great. So, yeah, Jocelyn mm -hmm. Stevenson, our our head writers are uh, Alex Cutherson and Matt Fussfeld, who are incredible. They, they created New Girl on TV and they're just amazing. Um, Charlie Feldman, Doug Lyons, uh, Maura Mambrella, um, um, Sabrina Jalice, uh, Doug, I think I said Doug Lyons. Um, Oh my gosh, who am I forgetting? I'm forgetting someone. I know I am. Um, uh, oh my God. Anyway, it was the most amazing group of writers in the world. And we just had such an incredible time together. It was such a learning experience every day in that room. And you also had some original Fraggle, not only Jocelyn, but some other Fraggle folk that were along oh, for yeah. this ride. Well, that was really yes. important to us. You know, we, well, first of all, on the entirety of the series, Dave Goals. And Karen Prell came back. So both as performers and as co-executive producers. So um, Dave uh, couldn't be there in person, but he voiced Boober and Traveling Matt. And so he, so Frank Meshkalite performed his puppets on set, and then Dave would uh, would do the dubbing later. Karen, though, came on set and did Red. Mm. So that was incredible. And we had Frank Meshkalite from the original series, who was the last, uh, he performed Junior Gorg in the last couple of seasons, the body of Junior Gorg. Uh -huh. So so he was so helpful with our, our Gorg performers and just, you know, being able to, again, tell tales of the original series. And yeah. then, in, but in the room, in the writer's room and in the creation of the show, you know, having Karen, having Dave, having Jocelyn. And then we did this thing in the beginning called the Fraggle Gaggle, where we basically brought back as many of our original uh, the original folk who worked on the show as possible just to kind of, you know, glean from them, like, what are things that you, you, you know, feel like you could have done more of? What are things mm. you learned? Cause it was really important to kind of enter into this and go, okay, let's, let's like take advantage of the fact that this was this, we're not rebooting the show because the first didn't work. We're rebooting it because it is so beloved and let's, how can we tell new fraggle stories that relate to kids today dealing with issues that are so different than the kids in the eighties dealt with in many ways, you know? Um, and so we wanted to kind of like say like, let's, so starting ground is the original series was perfect. Right. So we don't want to, we don't want to shake it up too much. We just want to like take that and then just have the adventures big broader and go different places. And, you know, what are some things you love to do that you didn't get a chance to do the first time? What are some places you wish you had gone? What are some storylines you wish you had enhanced that, maybe you just for whatever reason you didn't get a chance to do. 
So, you know, and what I didn't know, even being the nerd I was of Fraggle Love, is that, you know, there was it, a lot of times TV shows wind down because people go, you know what, we've done we've done this many seasons and there's not really a whole lot more storytelling to do. So, you know, that's not the case with Fraggle Rock. They had plans for seasons beyond. It's just mm. that Jim felt that it was, it was time to move on. So I think that everyone was excited to now go like, oh, we can open up the floodgates again. Like we can pull this out and that out, you know? It, it, is it supposed to be that it takes place in today's world? Yes. So that, so that was the big question was, you know, where do we set this? Because, you know, we didn't want to do a prequel, because it felt like there was so much that got established in the original series that it just, it would be hard to, it'd be limiting, you know, because yes, then you'd have agree, to always yeah. get everything there. And we didn't want to do a continuation um, because by the end of the original series, they had, they had put everything in this beautiful place where there was such an understanding between species, you know, Doc and Sprocket moved to the desert. Um, and also, you know, Jerry Parks had passed away, the original Doc. And so, we'd have to explain that and deal with that. And then junior already gets along with the fraggles and it, it just, it felt like why, why reopen any conflict there? Do you know what I mean? It was mm -hmm. so, yeah. and we wanted the original series to stand on its own. So the idea came about to kind of do for lack of a better way of putting it an alternate world of it. So ah. it's, it's basically like you're learning the world all over again. Um, but keeping, the majority of the canon exactly the same. So wow. it's still the five main fraggles. Uncle Traveling Matt still comes out to our world to explore. <laughs> They're still learning how to get along with the Gorgs and the Doozers. And so it, and it was just like an opportunity to kind of start again and say, now living in 2021 at the time, you know, what if, what if the fraggles had to deal with our world today? What if Uncle Matt had to come upon an iPhone or, you know, things that, like, did not exist back in the 80s, you know? And what if, you know, what if kids today are dealing with, with issues and the Fraggles are going to deal with issues that, that are, are more relevant, like echo chambers? What does an echo chamber mean? You know, what is consent? Mm. What is, you know, being an ally? What is mm. um, when you're given in the Fraggle way, you know, you're a social media star in the Fraggle way, and you, ha you have the opportunity and the, and the position to be a good leader or a bad leader. You know, so it, it's all these things that like you maybe weren't as weren't as prevalent in the '80s that now kids really yeah. are dealing with, and and it was wow. just a chance to take the world bigger. You know, to kind of go yeah. like, what if we built a cinematic set for Fraggle Rock, and you know, you really got to see the Great Hall as a giant space, and you know, because the original series was shot in a very small soundstage. <laughs> I was kind of yeah. in shock when they showed me like the blueprints. I was like, oh my god, so tiny. <laughs> uh, so you shot in uh, Calgary. Calgary, Calgary, Canada. And, and how big was the space there? And what did you do to it to expand that world? You know, it's funny. I remember when we were designing, our, our amazing uh, production designer, Tyler Heron, um, kept saying, I'm worried it's all going to fit. And I was like, what? Because we had the, the Calgary Film Center are three massive warehouse sound stages. I mean, they're giant. They're the biggest sound stages I've ever worked on. Um, and I was like, what is he talking about? Like, it's Fraggle Rock, right? Like, I'm like, what? <laughs> but what he did was he, he designed these beautiful, giant spaces. So the Gorg's Garden, I think in the original, what I understand is that, is that the, the Gorg's Garden took up, like, the size of, like, a big living room, basically, in the original set. It was, like, a corner of the set. It was, this took up the entirety of, of that particular soundstage. Wow. Um, and you'll see it when you see the show. It's, it's, it's a massive scale. He really built on a Gorg scale. Because it gave us the opportunity to go, oh, let's actually build the big garden you could never see. And let's actually build, like, you know, Marjorie the Trash Heap was supposed to be on the other side of the castle, but you could never see it continually. Well, let's see it continuously. Let's see where it all fits. So he really took it and just kind of expanded it, you know, keeping the same rules and keeping the same, you know, the rules that always go with puppetry, right? Where you don't want the set to overwhelm the puppets. Mm -hmm. But, like, the Great Hall was massive. I think, I can't even imagine... I don't know foot wise how big it was, but it was, it was giant, you know? And I remember the first time we took Karen Prell in there to see it, she was just overwhelmed. She was like, Oh my God. She's like, you could fit like, you know, 10 of the original great halls in here. <laughs> and so it was really cool. Cause it just felt like if we're going to do this, let's, let's give it the, the, you know, you can't do Fraggle Rock you know, halfway, you've got to, it's such a perfect show. And it's so, it was made with such a detail and such love in the original 
that you we had to do it at the very least at that level. And we just were like, what what are the things we could just take it up? Let's make it a little bit more colorful. Let's give it more 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 depth. Let's have a real waterfall. Let's have a second level to have fraggles up wow. on the second level. The doozers built a monorail, so now there's a doozer monorail that goes through <laughs> the Great Hall. It was just like, let's just kind of what are the things we could we could, you know, take from the original and just build upon it. Kind of plus it. You're just going to plus it. Yeah. It it wasn't about. Uh, it was never like let's throw that out. You know, right. I hate when reboots do that. I hate when when you get a chance to revisit something, and I find a lot of pop culture things do this where there's such a fear of feeling quote unquote old, or there's such a fear of not putting your mark on it or not right. making it whatever. That that they they take the bones of what worked so well and what people love about it, and they throw that out just to say that they're doing something new. And we were yeah. totally against that. It was like. This is a show that is so loved, that works so well, that's made such an impact on so many people. And so, you know, it was like, let's just start with what works really well. And then let's just tweak, tweak the things that could be a little bit stronger. Let's talk a, just for a second about Gobo, just because, yeah. I, I, you know, he's the leader of the Fraggles and, and you're the leader of this show. How do you look at that role in your stable of characters that you play? Like, what do you, what do you think about him as a character and what does he represent to you? Honestly, I think he, to me, he represents Jerry. I mean, I think when I watch, there's a reason I think I loved, out of all of Jerry's characters, I think I loved Gobo the most as a kid. And I think it's because from everything I I got to know about Jerry, and I know you got to know him really well, you know, Jerry was a leader by example um, and was pretty stable and pretty kind of like, you know, um, go with the flow to use a song from the show, you know, <laughs> and, and led by example. And I think that that's who Gobo is. I think that he's, you know, he has his flaws, of course, like all great characters do, but I think he is musical like Jerry. I think he is, uh, he looks out for the people he loves like Jerry. He tries to look at the big picture like Jerry. I think he just was Jerry. I think they wrote that character for Jerry. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I think, it, you know, it was starting there at that level of like, okay, who was Jerry Nelson? To me, Jerry, I didn't, I wish I had worked with him as long as, as you got to, you know, cause I left Sesame street to do Avenue Q. But yeah. to me, Jerry was just like this magical person who just had this quiet confidence and kindness and humanity about him. I mean, I always felt like when I got to be on a set with Jerry, I was just like, okay, just watch. Yeah. Just take it all in. <laughs> yeah. You know, he was, a, he was a cool dude. Just a cool dude, yeah. And I think that's who Gobo is. I think he's, you know, he's he is, I guess you could say Gobo is like the Kermit of this group of characters. Yeah. Um, he's the calm. He's the mm -hmm. center. You know, Red is out in left field. <laughs> Boober's out in right field. Wembley's upside down. Moki's <laughs> feeling the vibes right. of the rock. And Gobo sometimes <laughs> just like, can we just put this all together, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. We're just trying to walk down this tunnel. Can we all like, just walk on, in line? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that's I think that's the basis of what he was, and then, you know, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to like all the characters. They wanted to find new layers of him and new mm. places for him to go, and so they gave me I think a lot of fun with. They let me be a little bit funnier than I think maybe the original Gobo was. I think I think Jerry was very funny in in many ways, but I think he was he did play him a little bit more like. I remember Dave saying that he played him very John Wayne. Right, he played him kind of like, <laughs> all right, let's go, like very yeah. here, and I and I tried to play him, give him a little bit more goofiness, a little more fun. Um, but oh my god, it was just like you know, every every time we put on Gobo's guitar, and I got to sing a song. I just would be like, okay, Jerry, help me, like you know, because <laughs> yeah, because again, like that that voice and that music is is so ingrained in I think every Muppet fan's head. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's who Gobo is. I think I think he's just he's he's the he's he's just like the one. If if you know if Wembley's if Wembley's, you know, can't make up his mind which way to go, if Moki's like talking to the vibes of the rock about which direction to go, if Red is already <laughs> down the path and if Boober's way behind, Gobo's just like with his map, just steady moving ahead. Yeah. And I feel like yeah. that, and I think that's your job as a, you know, as a puppet captain and as yeah. anyone who is so blessed to lead a group of people is your job isn't to tell everyone how to do their job. Your job isn't to force anything your job is to just kind of keep a clear direction and just kind of keep things moving as best you can and let everyone kind of get there the way they need to get there yeah that's awesome and you have a great team 
And and uh, oh my gosh. I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to you know just devouring the entire season. I cannot wait, and I hope you get to do more. I pray we do too. I I feel like that was the greatest thing is getting to the end of our season. We're like no 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 no. We just we no 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 no. Like there's so much more. There's oh. so much more. Um. So I think yeah. I hope we get to do more. And I think I think it's um. For me, it's funny. My joke was, and I think you'll appreciate this, Matt. I feel like knowing my story a little bit more now. My joke was like, well, I guess I'm going to die <laughs> because I felt like <laughs> I've done everything. I have done Literally, everything. <laughs> yeah, I, I know like, what you mean. I was ready yeah. for like, you know, at the end of our rap at like in Calgary, I was like, so when does the, when does the bus hit me? Like, cause I was just like, <laughs> it just felt so like, like this was everything I've ever done my entire career. I really do believe prepped me for the show. I don't think I, I was not as, I don't think if I hadn't had the, the, the musical theater training, and doing doing a character voice, you know, in Avenue Q all those years that that helped me understand my voice. I was bad at voices until I did Avenue Q, genuinely. You know, that show got me ready for that. I think everything kind of got me to be ready to do this show. And I really believe that. So it just it just it feels very full circle and it feels very I'm still like, you know, dodging <laughs> Yeah. oncoming vehicles <laughs> like yeah. i want to be, be careful more. <laughs> yeah, be yeah, careful exactly. of those people that are outside cutting your tree they don't cut <laughs> like a well he's done frog rock let's take him out yeah <laughs> oh um, my god but i'm i'm so impressed and i'm so proud of you john it's just awesome it really is i i it's exciting that you get to do this and that you had such an investment in it for for your whole life and now you're and now it's coming true it's 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 unbelievable well it's really i think cool. and you I'm, i don't want to speak for you but i feel like you I guess would say the same thing, which is like, I feel like, you know, we all, we all were very blessed to be put into the positions we were put into. And we happened to come in, at least at Sesame street at, at the right time and at yeah. a magical time. And, and I really do believe that it's like, you know, just like you pursued music and other interests for you, that it's so important when you love something that you keep it as a passion and then if it's, it can't just be the only thing you fall in love with because, because then, then it becomes, you lose perspective, right? I think like I couldn't appreciate Fraggle Rock and I couldn't appreciate the great, the great things I've gotten to do if I didn't get to do other things that make me happy and didn't have other people in my life that make me happy. I think you, ha you have to keep those, those pillars, you know, and then when you yeah. get to hopefully do the thing you love more than anything, you appreciate it 10 times more. Well, John. Are you ready yes. for some rapid fire questions? <gasps> oh, I didn't know this is cop. Yes, do it. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm just going to say them. You just say the first thing that comes to the top of your head. Okay. Here we go. What is the hardest part about being a puppeteer? Body aches. <laughs> What's the easiest <laughs> part? <laughs> um, making people happy. Ah. What is your biggest strength as a puppeteer slash performer? Oh, God. Um, oh, uh, endurance. Ah, what is your biggest weakness? Mm -hmm. um, second guessing. Uh, what is uh, one of your favorite things about being a fraggle performer? Oh, God. Mm, getting a chance to do stories that are, are deep and meaningful and soulful, which we don't always get to do as puppeteers. Yeah, that's true. If you weren't... Okay, this is a little tricky. If you weren't a puppeteer or a performer or or a creator of television shows or an executive <laughs> producer, what do you think your career would be? You know, I always say it, it would either be working with animals in some capacity because I love animals, whether it's like a zoo ca caretaker or like a conservationist or a teacher because I love kids. So it would be oh, one of the great. two. That's great. So there are probably people listening out there, John, who want to hear you tell them what they have to do to become a television puppet performer. So what would it be? I think it's a little bit what I said earlier. I, th I think it's getting as wide of a swath of, of talents and experience. Because I think sometimes when we want to become puppeteers, I know this from my, my experience, I became so obsessed with the movement, so obsessed with the, li the lip sync and the manipulation that I wasn't paying attention to the things I really needed, which was an understanding of character, an understanding of timing, an understanding of voices, an understanding of musicality. Mm -hmm. I learned all that on the job and, and by accident, and I learned it by pursuing my other passions. 
So, you know, when I was younger, I would say yes to everything. You know, someone's like, you want to go to a dance class? Yes. You know, do you want to go, do you want to go to a pottery class? Sure. Do you want to go downtown and watch this new show? Sure. It was just kind of like absorbing as much as possible because I think it's easy to get only invested in the one single art of puppetry and not in everything. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and it always paid off. You know, it always like taking voiceover classes helped me understand how to manipulate my voice better so I could do a character voice and not hurt myself, which is a big thing. You know, yeah. obviously pursuing theater helped me with my singing. So when I got a show like Fraggle Rock, where it's so much music, I could learn how to sing in that character voice, you know, um, taking dance class. I remember when Kevin asked me to help choreograph that uh, 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 Destiny's oh, Child number with, yeah. with Elmo. And I was like, what's happening? You know, <laughs> like, I, I, he knew that I took dance class. And so he knew I had an yeah. understanding of dance. So I think it's, it's really, I would say, just, just don't get singularly focused and pursue anything that interests you because that's what I think that's what Jim did. Like, I think, you know, it was kind of like, he didn't say I want to be a puppeteer. He said, I want to work in television and here's a bunch of different ways I can do Mm. that. You know? And I think that that's, that's for all of us, I think who are, who are, who love what we do. It's like, you know, it's like you pursuing your, your music, right? It's like, it's like that it's not only helped you as a puppeteer, I'm sure, but also it's opened your mind to other ways to create. And, and so I think it's just important to have that. And the other thing I will say is, you have to have an understanding of what's come before you. And I say this to Broadway performers all the time, up and coming. There's so many theater kids who love Broadway, but they only know Broadway right now. They have no knowledge of right. who Carol Channing was, who Elton Merman was. Like, John, that, you know, <laughs> I can't even think of another example right now, but like Patty LaPone, like what, Patty LaPone's first show. Um, yeah. Charles Nelson Riley was in the original Hello Dolly. What? Like people don't know that, right? So, yeah. so I think the same thing with puppetry. I think it's like you now have YouTube. And all these mm-hmm. things that I wish we, you and I had had when we were younger, yeah. can you imagine? Yeah. Where you can watch every making of special, you can watch every documentary, you can watch every autobiography, you can watch every clip from everything. So, <laughs> you know, like, like go back and watch, you know, how things came to be. You know, yeah. go back and watch the original Sam and Friends. Go back and watch Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. Go back and watch Pinwheel. Go back and watch, you know, The Great <laughs> okay, Space yeah. Coaster, right? Yeah. Right? All yeah. these shows that were like, there was like different techniques and different things and people yeah. were learning and some of it's great. Some of it's not so great, but like you, that's how we learn. You have to respect what came before you. And I think that's my biggest, that and just expanding your, your opportunities to learn, I think are the two biggest things I would say. That's great. Okay. The last question, this is oh going to be hard. Good. Jerry Nelson once said to me, Sesame street is great, but always have something that is your own John mm-hmm. that you create. Mm-hmm. Now you have created shows. <laughs> you have, uh, you've done a lot of stuff. So yes. is there something, what is that for you that you create that is all your own that maybe we don't know about? Wow. Um, well, I think it's twofold. I think, you know, I'm lucky. I host a, a, a show on Sirius XM every Sunday, which is my show. And I get to talk about whatever I want and I get to introduce Broadway music in the way I want to. And it's not that it's it's the most like I love doing it, but it's not like it's the most like creatively challenging thing I've ever done, but it is nice that it's my thing that I get to do. And I get to just talk as myself and I'm not playing a character and I'm not absorbing myself into some other world. It's like, it's just real. And I get to just create and make it whatever I want it to be. So that's, that's really cool. That's very cool. That's really cool. But I think it's also, you know, I love getting the chance now to make new things. And, and I'm so blessed to have that position at Henson to be able to like work on a new TV show or work on a new series or work on a new idea. Um, and I feel very lucky with that because I feel like, you know, it, that's such a rare position to be in. And I know that. So I think it's that. And then I think it's little things too, right? It's just like, like uh, cooking. I love to cook, yeah. you know, yeah. or, or singing. I love to sing. I lo- like, it's having your other things that, that mm-hmm. make you happy and satisfy you. And it doesn't, it's, you're not dependent on work to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I guess well, that's the answer. That's a great <laughs> answer. I love, I love that answer. I love I, all your answers were fantastic, John. Look, Hey, you know what? I have taken up way too much of your time and I appreciate this. I miss you and I, miss I you love too. you. I love and you too. I, I can't wait to see you again sometime in person. I know. <laughs> Whenever. I don't know when that is. I have no idea how this is going to work in the world. Well, but... I got to get back to New York more often. You have to come to LA more often. That's, That's it. Right. We'll just have to figure that out. That's true. But thank you so much for joining me today on Below the Frame. 
Anytime. That's it. That's Below the Frame. We'll be back with a brand new episode next week, the penultimate episode of season two, where Stephanie DeBruzzo is talking with me. That's right. I finally sit down and tell my story on Below the Frame. Get updates and stuff about Below the Frame and Muppets, Sesame Street, The Mighty Weaklings, and whatever else I feel like posting on my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok accounts at Welcome Matt V. Below the Frame is produced by me, Matt Vogel. The theme song was written by Stephanie DeBruzzo and performed by my band, The Mighty Weaklings. The podcast artwork was created by Dave Holtine at DaveHoltineDesign.com. Special thanks to Jan Nelson for giving me Jerry's stories and to John Kennedy for sharing a memory and reading a story by Jerry Nelson. Thanks to John Tartaglia, Stephanie DeBruzzo, and to you, the fans, for listening. I am Matt Vogel. We'll see you next time when we go Below the Frame. Bye-bye. Go, go, go.